Uh, okay. Uh, good evening, everybody. This is a wonderful endeavor from the Heart Failure Association of India. And this, uh, this is different from the routine, uh, multiple the uh, deluge of webinars we see because there are three things which, which uh, for which uh, Dr. Harikishan has to be specifically appreciated. One is that we restricted the number of registrations to everybody has to participate in all the uh, sessions to get the certificate. And there is a, 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 if I can call that an exam after that, for the certification. All these are very good endeavors. And uh, what we do is we would do with the recap of the previous session and then go on to the session. I hand over to the coordinators and uh, let's uh, get the ball rolling. Uh, Dr. Uday, you can uh, start with the recap. So, thank you very much, Abraham and Hari. Vijay, let's get on with the recap of the discussion we had last time. We had a discussion on acute decompensated heart failure. And uh, let me start the share screening straight away without spending any more time. All right. Is it uh, clearly visible, the slides? Yes. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Thank you very much. So uh, I started the clinical presentation on acute decompensated heart failure. And I said, this is something very important. These are all very basic clean points that helps you as a clinician deciding what is the probability of mortality. These points are so simple in practice. You just look at the age of the patient parameters like the systolic blood pressure, uh, what has been his heart rate, what has been his sodium estimation, that's important. And then based on this, you can look at the probability of death, right? So look at the total score, let's say, look at the systolic blood pressure, it falls less than 100. A person at the age of 60 and above, his heart rate more than 70, his burn has gone up more than 50. You immediately look at the probability of death that is exceeding 10%. And if it's sodium is low or high. So this is something which clinicians can follow in practice. I spoke on the and the various in acute heart failure. This follows the prior discussion, which talked about the EC, EKG, ECG, and echocardiography. I talked a bit on the importance of serum creatine, banana electrolytes, every one to two days in the hospital and necessarily before discharge. If the patient has come with a respiratory infection, which is quite common in India, let's say pneumonia, you want to do the procalcitonin in suspected cases of severe HF to know where you stand, as sepsis may add to the hypotension. It's good to do the liver function test. They are impaired, as we know, both because of drop in output and increased venous congestion. But it does help you identify those patients who are at a poor prognosis, underlying hypo and hyperthyroidism, as a recent paper in Indian Heart Journal by Mohan and his, uh, Jesse Mohan and his group showed 7% had hypo-hyperthyroidism. So please check for it. Do look into the anemia profile, the iron profile to be very specific because FCM is of a great utility. And there has been interest in looking at the sodium at the shirt. So hypernatremia, in fact, is associated with a six-fold higher one-month mortality and a three-fold higher one-year mortality as compared to even hyponatremia. So it's important to keep the sodium in the range of 135 to 145. Less than 135 is not great. More than 145 obviously increases the risk of death. Uh, the natriuretic peptides and ST2 are important bio, uh, biomarkers. Uh, the NPs are very high sensitivity. You can use them for uh, ruling out a, a, a heart failure. The thresholds for BNP is 100. Remember, a elevated one does not necessarily confirm the diagnosis of heart failure because there are multiple non-cardiac causes, respiratory, hepatic related, related. And at times, see very low NPs in patients who have come with an end-stage severe heart failure, patients with a flash pulmonary edema, and at times the right-sided heart failure. There are wearable devices these days that are coming into vogue. One of them I have mentioned, that's the dialectic sensing vest. Uh, 
So this helps to know how much is the lung water content and that correlates with your invasive pulmonary uh, uh, wedge pressure. Uh, I spoke on diuretics that uh, in patients, once the IV bolus dose is not working, you need to still continue with the bolus dose. Uh, in patients, a low far in that you may want to get a higher concentration of furosemide, and within 30 minutes, you expect a diuretic response. This is one of the algorithm which comes from a recent paper in Jack Heart Failure, three months back, and it, it puts it all in clinical order that the dose should be 2.5 times the home dose, the divided doses, or frusamide 80 milligrams if loop nine. And then you follow two parameters. One, either you look at the spot urine sodium, and second, which clinicians do, urine output. If it's less than 150 ml per hour, or the urine sodium is less than 50 to 70, there is a reason to administer double the dose of IV loop diuretic and then further increase it. And then eventually, if it doesn't settle down, then you add a sequential diuretic. So this table was very useful. When it comes to inotrope, look at blood pressure, less than 90, more than 90, less than 90, use a inotrope vasopressor, more than 90, use a vasodilator. If the patients are not clinically stabilized either way, then in, in, in patients who are on inotropes may require a mechanical circulatory support for patients who are on vasodilators. You can add an inotrope and see if they stabilize. If they do, they go for the chronic heart failure therapy. I did say that it's good to look at some of the other drugs, levosimendan and uh, the PDE3 inhibitor milrinone. Unlike our traditional dopamine, dobitamine, uh, and epinephrine, these drugs have the least vasoconstriction or no vasoconstriction with levosimendan adds the property of pulmonary vasodilatation. So the European Society of Cardiology is putting a lot of emphasis that if you look at in hospital mortality in these patients over a period of one month, levosimendan did much better than the traditional ones we use in clinical practice. A little better, a little above that and inferior would be dobutamine. And this brings a very fundamental thing Levosimendan has an effect on the afferent arteriole, dobutamine and milrinone on the efferent arteriole. So levosimendan improves the renal blood flow and the GFR. Dobutamine and milrinone may improve the renal blood flow, but the GFR drops. And if you combine the two, the renal blood flow really goes up, but the GFR is constant. Dr. J.C. Mohan spoke on the acute to chronic heart failure. The discharge protocol is a concern. When you look at the triad of what happens in acute heart failure, and he suggested a few points which are brilliantly highlighted. Discharge with optimal hemodynamics. Initiate guided um, therapy early as possible. Uptight rates as soon as possible. Use RNA preferentially. Take care of all the comorbidities, thyroid, anemia, respiratory infection. Please do vaccinate at discharge. You give them an Influvac 2020 and also give them a pneumococcal vaccine, though its efficacy is a little less, probably these things help. Always consider a device for those patients who require. Transition was one of the drugs for a, 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 a study for ARNI that looked at initiating this particular drug inside the hospital. And the other one was Pioneer HF, which you are all aware. Uh, it's important to see that these patients are not on infusions of loop diuretics. These patients are not on inotrope. They're reasonably stable. The BP is reasonably stable before you initiate it. Start at a lower dose, go slow, aim higher, and you will be able to achieve 200 milligram twice and find clinical benefits and a drop in the biomarkers. This is what I like what Dr. Mohan said. At discharge, keep these targets. Clinicians, please note this. HR less than 70. Systolic blood pressure more than 100, but less than 140. Anti-pro BNP less than 1,000. HB1AC reasonable, 7%. Keep the potassium between 4.2 and 4.5. Excellent clinical message. In patients on beta blockers, please continue the beta blockers. Unless heart rate is less than 50 or there is an advanced AV block. Once the condition is stable, then you can start this beta blocker and Please see that the beta blockers are, are escalated in their dose so that patient gets the best of benefit. Uh, Dr. Sundar, a senior cardiac surgeon, talked about heart transplants uh, 
surgery saying that is the gold standard. He mentioned about the survivals, one year, five, 10 and 20. Um, it seems up to five years, you still have a 70% survival. So that's a very good news for those patients who require it. Uh, the ESC guideline, two very important things that in those patients who have severe symptom or poor prognosis, well-motivated patients, please offer them. In patients who have active infection or, a, or let's say comorbid condition like cancer or multi-organ dysfunction or grossly obese or not likely to comply, then probably you don't offer. Dr. Diren Shah, the cardiac surgeon said, please refer to a cardiac surgeon. Let him take a call. Let him decide what the VO2s are. And then he may be able to guide you. Dr. Sundar also mentioned about cabbage, ischemic mitral surgery, and the mechanical complications of MI. Uh, one of the things he mentioned very clearly is that CABG is as good as CABG plus mitral surgery. And if it comes to mitral surgery, please then offer a mitral wall replacement because the repairs, though there are surgeons who are getting better by the day, still has a lot of readmissions. And then the conventional complications of MI also needed. We talked about LVAD, IBP, and Impella in terms of what you are looking at as a bridge. And here are some of the recommendations as a bridge to transplant. Uh, Dr. C. Narsiman from Hyderabad, the electrophysiology. I just call him electrophysiology because he's a master teacher. He teaches you everything that you want to know. Here are the recommendations he mentioned, and I think these are important. So if you look at the 1A recommendation, what does it tell you to carry on as a clinical message? In secondary prevention, to reduce the risk of sudden death and mortality, in any patient who had a arrhythmic storm, ventricular arrhythmic storm, and has become hemodynamically unstable. So that's very important. Also in patient of ischemic heart disease and dilated cardiomyopathy, it's recommended in those patients who have class two to three symptoms, LVF should be less than 45%. Over three months, they have taken all the OMTs and still they are symptomatic, please offer them. CRT, as he mentioned, and this becomes the class one guidelines, the first and the third column, very nicely given. If you have a patient who is in sinus rhythm, who is symptomatic, has taken all the medical treatment, his QRS is more than 150 and LBBP, please offer it. Between 130 to 150, there is a little lesser indication, but you can still offer it, right? CRT should be mentioned, should be preferred than RV pacing in any patient who has who has a requirement in terms of a AV block. So this is something that we need to keep in mind. Less than 130 millisecond CRT is contraindicated. This is the recap for the last session. Let's look forward to Dr. Abraham Oman taking us forward for this session. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I'll stop sharing the screen quickly. Okay, I request the moderators to take over and we have very senior persons, Dr. Iyengar. So please take over and take the uh, meeting forward. Sorry, I had to unmute, sir. Thank you, Dr. Abraham. Good evening, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, we'll go on to the next session. Uh, there are very important uh, topics because most of these are reversible heart failure situations. We must pay a lot of attention to these uh, uh, lectures. Uh, the first talk is going to be by Dr. Ambuj Roy. Uh, he's going to talk to us on peripartum cardiomyopathy. I will also welcome my co-chairpersons, Jayesh and uh, Yosef. Dr. Ambush, would you like to start? Thank you, Dr. Anger. Uh, and uh, was, first of all, I must congratulate HFAI on this excellent initiative uh, uh, because heart failure is something which is rapidly changing uh, area. Uh, uh, and there's a lot to know, and the burden also is increasing. So, increase, there is no way that physicians should not be involved in management. And uh, everybody, uh, treat, all treating physicians, should know about the basics of heart failure management. Today we'll talk about some niche areas of heart failure, and one of them that I am is repartum cardiomyopathy. A relatively uncommon condition, uh, 
and uh, but it's something which is uh, one of the better prognosis as compared to other heart failure conditions and it's something that uh, everybody should be aware of and uh, the, since this is a certificate course, I'll start by, by what I propose should be the learning objectives for all the uh, our, uh, esteemed uh, members who are attending the meeting. So at the end of it, I hope to tell them when and to suspect on how to diagnose peripartum cardiomyopathy, what are the risk factors and who is susceptible to develop peripartum cardiomyopathy. Very briefly, the etiopathogenesis the management of peripartum cardiomyopathy, both in acute and chronic therapy, and the other non-cardiac issues that everybody looks up to cardiologists to advise on, whether it be you know, contraception or lactation, whether these people can do that, and how to counsel, uh, counsel uh, for subsequent pregnancy. This is the million dollar question, uh, always in peripartum uh, cardiomyopathy. So I like to take these topics as we go along, uh, it would suffice to say, you know, in 1971, in a very uh, uh, landmark paper, Demarcus uh, in circulation with Rahim Tullah first coined this term uh, called peripartum cardiomyopathy, where he suggested its development of cardiac failure in the last month of uh, pregnancy or within the five months after delivery. There's absence of unifiable uh, cause for cardiac failure. And of course, there should not be a recognizable heart disease present to diagnose uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. In other words, it was seen as a diagnosis of exclusion. So uh, in the absence of other causes for heart failure, if there is a heart failure peripartum, then that was called uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. And of course, it was later added that there essentially has to be systolic dysfunction and presence of LV ejection fraction less than 45% and LV dilatation was added to the uh, definition. However, in, 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 uh, as we moved forward and there was more uh, knowledge about the disease, and again, in a, you know, there are two, three really landmark papers, and this, this is the next one by uh, uh, al Kam uh, in circulation again. Uh, and they showed that the peripartum cardiomyopathy occurs not only in the first month, could, but it could occur in, in the weeks even before that. The onset could occur uh, in the weeks before uh, the last month. And therefore the de definition was further modified. In fact, there were 20 to 30 cases which happened in the second and third semester. And the, the they, they further modified the definition uh, that the, it is idiopathic cardiomyopathy presenting during the later part of the pregnancy or the first five months postpartum with all the uh, other definition criteria that I mentioned above. So what's the clinical presentation? Well, it's very important to have uh, a high index of suspicion, you know, because the symptoms and signs, as you can see, are kind of similar to what you see normally in, uh, in a patient of uh, heart failure. But the important thing is some of these can overlap with any pregnancy. You know, people, women, expectant mothers are sometimes dyspneic because of some anemia, because of just general cardiovascular overload. I mean, the changes in the cardiovascular uh, physiology. Uh, so you have to be have a keep, keep a keen eye and a suspicion of presence of peripartum cardiomyopathy. Uh, so look for uh, any other symptoms like orthopnea. There are signs, of course, of classical signs of heart failure. Look for cardiomegaly, uh, presence of rhythm, gallop rhythm, but fetal edema or any murmurs. Of course, very severe cases can present with uh, shock, cardiogenic shock and multi-organ failure, or there may be uh, arrhythmias in the early phases, whether it could be supraventricular, ventricular, or even a sudden cardiac deaths have been reported. But one of the uh, common uh, presentations, uh, unlike other heart failure, and it's much more common in peripartum cardiomyopathy, is thromboembolism. And uh, it, it's been seen as many as 10 to 17% of the people uh, patients of peripartum cardiomyopathy can have an LV thrombus at the apex in the initial uh, cardiogram. And uh, you know, and five to 10% of women have thromboembolic system complications of thromboembolism. So, and there are several reasons which uh, for this uh, milieu to be a more susceptible thromboembolism. Uh, there is the hypercoagulable state of pregnancy. Of course, there is cardiac dilatation and dysfunction. So there is uh, pooling of blood in the heart. And uh, there is venous stasis, there is bed rest, and there is post-operative status after a cesarean section, for example. Uh, there is some dehydration. So all this makes you more susceptible to 
uh, the thromboembolic complications that may happen. And they are relatively more frequent uh, in peripartum cardiomyopathy as, a, as compared to other idiopathic uh, cardiomyopathies. Uh, again, in the other uh, examinations, there is nothing very different from heart failure. You may have ECG changes, but sometimes it may still be normal in certain percentage of people. ECO should typically show LV dilatation and injection fraction less than 45%. As I said, they can be looked carefully at the apex for a pico thrombus, because if you miss that, then uh, you may uh, treat, suboptimally treat these patients. Uh, chest X-ray may have coronary congestion, like any classical heart failure. And most importantly, you know, BNP helps a lot. Where you have a high index of suspicion, do a BNP or an anti broke BNP. And it is markedly raised. So that helps you establish a diagnosis where there is an element of doubt. Of course, mild elevations can occur in preeclampsia, uh, which is one of the uh, uh, precursors or, 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 or I would say a risk factor for developing uh, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy. But the BNP levels here are markedly raised, unlike preeclampsia. And there are other investigations, uh, which I will not go to uh, here, but you could do them to rule out other structural heart diseases. And sometimes you may have to do myocardial biopsy, for example, you're suspecting myocarditis and specific myocarditis. But in the absence of that, uh, these tests would not be required. What about the incidence? So it's quite variable in different cities uh, from, from different countries. Clearly, this uh, is more common in developing countries, and uh, I'll, uh, that can be linked to the etiopathogenesis of the disease. So it's much higher in African countries, and we know African Americans are more prone to it, even in the United States. So it's as high as one into one uh, is to 100 in Nigeria. Uh, in the US, Canada, it's one in 2,500 live births. Japan, reports a much lower incidence, one in 20,000. And just one study from India that I could find, uh, we, re we reported one in about 1,400 cases. But it's important to look at the people who might be at increased risk for developing this, and so have a high index of suspicion to suspect uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy in these people. So of course, as I said, the uh, African-American race, the almost three to 16 times in different studies more susceptible as compared to the whites in the US. If you have preeclampsia and hypertension uh, in during pregnancy, that is PIH, you're more likely to develop peripartum cardiomyopathy. Higher maternal age, you know, if you're more than 40 years versus mothers who are less than 20 years, there's a 10 times higher chance of developing peripartum cardiomyopathy. So higher maternal age and multi-gestational pregnancies, like twin pregnancies, uh, can happen as, uh, are as common as 9%. Uh, in, in uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy as compared to 3% in the normal, uh, in non-peripartum non cardiomyopathy women. So it's, that's also a predisposing cause. And then there are certain genetics which predispose. And they're kind of common to dilated cardiomyopathy, which brings us to say that if you have the susceptibility to develop dilated cardiomyopathy, if you have the, uh, so the GTN gene, which is common in dilated cardiomyopathy, abnormalities, then you are also likely to de develop peripartum cardiomyopathy. So there is a link uh, in terms of uh, genetic background between dilated cardiomyopathy and peripartum cardiomyopathy. So, uh, you know, I'll not go in detail so the etiopathogenesis because it's essentially uh, not within the mandate of this course, but it will be good to just know uh, what are the traditional uh, etiopathogenesis, which was given for years. And uh, it's supposed to be a viral myocarditis. Then there were abnormal immune response, like uh, micro where the fetal cell goes and uh, is, is proposed to go and rest in the mother's heart. And then uh, there is, uh, once the immune, immune uh, milieu changes, then there is autoimmune uh, reactions uh, or immune reactions to this, uh, these cells in the heart leading to peripartum cardiomyopathy. Then very commonly it was said malnutrition and selenium deficiency could be one of the factors. A use of prolonged tocolysis uh, during uh, the end of the pregnancy was also associated as uh, one of the reasons. And abnormal hemodynamics of pregnancy was again one of the things. But if you can see here, the abnormal hemodynamics persist for most part of the second and third trimester. But the peak of uh, of uh, the uh, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy happens only in the peripartum area. So this hemodynamics is, does not explain. And most of these uh, have been postulates and do not have very firm scientific uh, basis to explain them. 
But as you see the prolactin levels, and I'll come to that, uh, and the FST, FSTL1, that is the uh, soluble uh, cytokinase 1 levels, which are high during the second part uh, of the pregnancy. To, uh, and that's the part where very part of cardiomyopathy stands in. And that's where there is a lot of interesting uh, uh, signs going on presently. As I said, I will not go into the details of that, but it would suffice to say that there, are, there have been two animal models of peripartum cardiomyopathy, and they've shown that in these uh, STAT3 knockout mice, mouse model and another vascular hormone mouse model, that it is the, uh, so the prolactin fragments which are increased and which are vasculotoxic and uh, which lead to myocardial dysfunction. And bromocoptin in this, these mice had uh, completely reversed the, uh, the, the cardiomyopathy. So that brought the prolactin hypothesis into the picture. And this was confirmed in another um, animal study where it showed this. But here they both, uh, 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 they showed both uh, VEGF and uh, pro prolactin being responsible. And that's also been seen in uh, human uh, so studies. Well, the treatment uh, is, I would say, in, in two, three parts. One is, of course, the standard treatment. You give loop diuretics like any heart failure, and you give vasodilators. During pregnancy, of course, you can only use hydrolyzing nitrates. Postpartum, it's safe to use um, any of those uh, RAS inhibitors. ACE inhibitors, ARB and RNE can be used. Uh, beta blockers can be used during pregnancy also with caution. Most of the people have shown it to be safe during pregnancy without much of IUGR, which is a feared complication of uh, beta blockers. Uh, then uh, like any other heart failure, you can use MRA again in the postpartum period and not during pregnancy. And other drugs, supportive drugs like ibuprofen, uh, digoxin may be used. There is a special role, as I said, of anticoagulation because of increased propensity to thromboembolism. And you may use low heparin, low molecular weight heparin during pregnancy and warfarin and, uh, is, can be used postpartum. There are no data with the newer drugs, uh, no newer oral anticoagulants that do X. When should you use anticoagulants? And this is the, uh, I emphasize a little bit on this because this is a little different from uh, other heart failures. So you would do it in most of the patients with severe LV dysfunction. You would do it in bedridden patients. Uh, of course, if there's AF, LV thrombus, you must mandatorily give uh, decoagulation in, and also in patients with obesity or already thrown a thromboembolism. Or very importantly, if you put bromocriptine therapy, which I'll come to in subsequent slide, uh, this uh, makes you more susceptible to thromboembolism. And all these patients who you start on bromocriptine must be on anticoagulation. So coming to the bromocriptine, which is, I would say, more experimental right now. Uh, and the first trial was by Sliva, uh, you know, present World Heart Federation president. And it's a very small pilot study of 20 patients shows remarkable benefit of giving post uh, promocryptin in the post uh, pregnancy period. And she gave it uh, in the, that study, the authors had given it for uh, a six week period. Uh, and, and, and they showed remarkable benefits both in terms of LV function improvement and in terms of se severe outcomes, including death. However, these results were not reciprocated in larger studies, which are again observational studies, I would say, uh, from Germany. And that's why it is still considered only a class 2B indication by uh, ESC guidelines. Uh, and the, there is no recommendation by US FDA to use it. So I would say it's still experimental. There is a, a rebirth, which is a big trial, which is to take off uh, for uh, user promocryptine so that we can get more data on using this therapy in uh, very part of cardiomyopathy. Uh, what about advanced therapies? There is, ro there is you know, uh, uh, early recovery of uh, heart failure in large majority of, in, in several of these, almost 50% of the people. So giving them ICDs is not a good idea because then we will improve. But however, there is conflicting data you know, of the early period before a heart failure develops. What about sudden death? In them and there is data conflicting from two studies and some people therefore if you have uh, indicators for chance of SCD like frequent VPCs or history of synco have advocated use of variable variable defibrillators which we're hearing about from the last talk uh, last week's talk which can be used as an alternative 
till six months and the LV function improves and there is no more uh, in indication, conventional indication for ICD, then we can discontinue that and not give an ICD or otherwise go on to an ICD. LVADs have been used and even cardiac transplant uh, in peripartum cardiomyopathy uh, has been used, but uh, despite the young age, uh, patients who undergo peripartum uh, cardiac transplant in peripartum cardiomyopathy don't do as well as other patients with higher graft rejection rates, probably because of increased uh, higher graft failure rates because of increased rejection or uh, you know the higher pre-transplant acuity where they are done. What about breastfeeding? So uh, initially in 2010, uh, European statement had uh, advised against uh, this. However, more recent data supports that you should uh, encourage uh, peripartum women to undergo uh, to, to, to breastfeed their children, uh, the child, and uh, it's especially strongly dependent in uh, our kind of uh, low middle income countries. And a small study has shown actually that the women who breastfeed actually had higher rates of recovery. So currently, there is no contraindication to breastfeeding in uh, women who are suffering from peripartum cardiomyopathy. Uh, it's very important uh, to advise them on contraception. As I said, these are non-cardiac issues, but it's important because, you know, uh, as we know, subsequent pregnancy is, them can be very uh, tricky. And I'll discuss that in my subsequent slides. But, uh, you know, uh, so contraception, you should avoid avoid estrogen-based contraceptives because in that increases thromboembolism and use more progesterone-releasing subcutaneous plants or intrauterine devices, which have been shown to be safe and effective uh, in these patients. Of course, tubal ligation and vasectomy are other options. Uh, what are the outcomes? The good thing is now almost half of the affected women will recover their systolic function and uh, most of it will occur within the six months. Once you've not recovered within six months, then the likelihood of recovery in future becomes much lower and the disease is almost irreversible. Although there are reports of late recovery too, but most of the time the recovery will occur within the first six months. And, and if you can see in this graph, uh, they, it's, it's much better uh, the outcomes for peripartum cardiomyopathy as compared to other cardiomyopathies. Uh, and the prognosis is poorer in black women, multiparous women, and those who are older than 30 years of age. So what are the prognostic factors? When, if the woman asks you, uh, once she's diagnosed by peripartum cardiomyopathy, immediately after that, what are my future chances? So baseline LVF is the most important uh, predictor. If you have EF of more than 45% at two months, then there is a, a chance of full recovery in 75% of the women. However, if the LVEF is less than 30%, then your chance of recovery is much lesser. Uh, understandably, more the LV dilatation, LV thrombus and RV dysfunction are poor prognostic signs. High baseline troponin levels are again a poor marker, and BNP levels, and as I said, the SFLT1 levels, uh, if they are higher, then they are again poor prognostic markers. But as I said, the, uh, the last part which I'll talk about is the subsequent pregnancy. And this is the most tricky question that you have to handle, especially in our parts of the world where women are uh, you know, quite inclined because of family pressures. Uh, and, uh, you know, the societal requirements for uh, a second pregnancy. So how do you advise them? And that is something which uh, all physicians should be aware of. So it really primarily depends on the recovery of myocardial function, how well your myocardium has improved. Uh, the pre-pregnancy LVF is a stronger predictor of outcome. And the detection of subclinical, sometimes people have said that even if people were near normal LV function, may have subclinical LV dysfunction and do a stress test. Well, this is something which is proposed as not well tested, but can be done uh, in some cases. So this is data is based again uh, by a lot of work by al uh, on this NEGM paper, where they clearly showed that the group A, which is people who had normalized LV function, uh, did much better. Though even in them, if you notice, 20% would develop heart failure during pregnancy, despite the fact that they are normalized LV function, it would be all more than twice in women who had normal LV, who did not recover LV function and who had uh, persistent LV dysfunction and, and still un, uh, undertook pregnancy. Uh, the, there is a significant drop, more than 20% LV dysfunction, LV function drop will happen in almost one quarter of the patients. And this will remain in month uh, during follow-up. And the maternal mortality 
thankfully was zero in the patients who had recovered every function, but I was as high as 20%, one in five women uh, who became pregnant despite having pelvic dysfunction uh, succumbed during the pregnancy. So that's a very high, uh, uh, poor outcome in these people. So subsequent pregnancy may lead to a significant and persistent depression of pelvic dysfunction. As I said, heart CHF and even death, more so in those with persistent pelvic dysfunction. Uh, so most uh, uh, most of the time, uh, I would uh, suggest that you counsel the woman to avoid future pregnancy if pelvic dysfunction is persistent after six months. They have to find other ways of uh, uh, extending the family. If the health function is normal, then uh, uh, then you know a considered decision has to be taken. Telling them the risk still that there is a twenty percent uh, risk of relapse uh, uh, if they undergo pregnancy. So this is how you would manage it. So you counsel both of the patients when when uh, they come to you about the risks of pregnancy or subsequent uh, pregnancy. Uh, what about uh, those who even with LV dysfunction, do undergo, uh, decide to, uh, you know, to undergo pregnancy. We need to stop their RAS inhibitors uh, and we need to do baseline eco and, uh, you know, uh, a baseline anti pro BNP in both of these you know, patients. Uh, then we need to uh, continue beta blockers in both groups. Uh, and we need to give hydralazine isosorbide dinitrate in symptomatic patients. So all patients who have LV dysfunction should be put on that, consider antidejoxin, and consider anticoagulation in patients who have non-recovered LV dysfunction, uh, non-recovered LV function. Uh, about follow-up, they obviously need very close follow-up, and they are uh, one of the high-risk pregnancies, very high-risk pregnancies. So we closely monitor the LV function and B, uh, BNP, anti-pro BNP levels uh, in the first and uh, at the end of the first, second trimester, one month prior to delivery, immediately our pre-hospital discharge and one month postpartum and if uh, any time the symptoms worsen. So you need a very close monitoring of these people with biomarkers and preferably with an LV function and uh, labor and delivery needs to be managed uh, very meticulously by a multidisciplinary team. So it needs to be preferably in uh, centers with uh, good uh, setups and backups. And uh, usually, we do not, uh, you do not recommend uh, cesarean only for peripartum cardiomyopathy. Uh, spontaneous vaginal delivery is good, unless there is, of course, uh, uh, obstetric reasons to consider cesarean suction. And we need to monitor their volume load, especially in the first 48 hours of delivery, because you know there will be a lot of shifts of uh, fluid into the intravascular space. So that is something we need to be very careful about. So the message is very close monitoring in these patients are required if they undergo subsequent pregnancy. So, so to summarize, the diagnosis of peripartum cardiomyopathy should be considered in any pregnant or postpartum woman with symptoms suggestive of heart failure. Institute early therapy in all cases. Uh, contraception counseling of risk of subsequent pregnancy is absolutely essential in all these patients. Uh, optimal duration of medications following recovery is a little bit unknown. Uh, but from taking a cue from dilated cardiomyopathy, most of these patients should be carried on uh, for uh, for some, for some time, and uh, should be gradually weaned off uh, their uh, uh, neurohormonal blockades, and not suddenly, as we've seen in the tread heart failure in DCM patients. Uh, you know, the pathogenesis and genetic uh, and hormonal milieu questions on that remain. The role of promocryptine remains uh, experimental, I would say, and the, we need more larger studies to really answer more questions of this disease. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, it is but natural that uh, Dr. Ambujarai, uh, Professor of Cardiology at Oradea Institute of Medical Sciences in Delhi, with his vast experience in the field, has given us an excellent picture of uh, uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy in this elegant presentation. Uh, I think questions will be taken at the end. So I request uh, Dr. Jayesh to introduce the next, next speaker, please. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, uh, thanks for organizing such a nice uh, uh, discussion and topics. So next topic, I request Dr. Rakesh Shadam. He will talk on arrhythmia-induced cardiomyopathy. So I hand over to Dr. Rakesh Shadam. Thank you, Dr. Jayesh. Yeah. Uh, my slides are there? Yeah, yeah. 
Yes, Good evening, evening, everybody, and I sincerely thanks Dr. Hari Krishna for this beautiful invitation. And uh, a lot of wonderful talks are going on, and I'm really listening all the talks. And my job is to introduce arrhythmia and use cardiomyopathy to the audience. Now, now this is an 18 years old female presented with heart failure. If you see the next ray, there is an cardiomegaly. His echo was done. Ejection fraction 20 percent. Treated for three months as dilated cardiomyopathy with usual medications. Nobody has given attention to his her ECG. Now, if you see the ECG, there is a clear cut P wave which are visible, and this patient is a clear case of ectopic atrial tachycardia. Yes, we the patient was taken for uh, ablation. The ablation was done. Patient goes in normal sinus rhythm. and believe me within 3 months a rejection fraction will become normal you see the x ray the cardiomegaly normalizes this is again a 15 years old male patient with ef of 25% and as usual these all patients are diagnosed as idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy outside but is one ecg showing a tachycardia and it is an ilvt idiopathic left ventricular tachycardia and this tachycardia is uh, ablatable tachycardia this was ablated and his ejection fraction from 25% within 6 weeks become normal so tachycardia cardiomyopathy now why it is at present known as arrhythmia induced cardiomyopathy because now it is well known that bradyarrhythmia arrhythmia can also lead to lv dysfunction so tachycardia cardiomyopathy is now being replaced by arrhythmia induced cardiomyopathy because we all know that complete heart block if persisted for long severe unexplained bradycardia may lead to cardio lv dysfunction but this concept that chronic tachycardia may lead to reversible ventricular dysfunction was way back in 1900 and it is gosage in 1930 first described the heart failure in a patient with atrial fibrillation it was 1937 Brill reported another case of atrial fibrillation congestive heart failure that reverses following restoration of sinus rhythm the relationship between tachycardia and reversible heart failure was first described by in 1949 now it is a wipples in 1962 who has established the first experimental model of tachycardia cardiomyopathy in rats the term tachycardia cardiomyopathy was coined by gellinger in 1985 and he gave a definition he gave the tachycardia cardiomyopathy is impairment of left ventricular function which is secondary to chronic uncontrolled tachycardia which is partially or completely reversible after normalization of heart rate and or rhythm irregularities that is very very important because it has to be it has to reverse that is of when you treat the tachycardia now if you see the prevalence incidence and casualty frequencies it is very difficult to estimate because the studies which are few number of studies are available the number of patients are very less and the patients who are referred for radio frequency ablations are generally included in these studies but but most described arrhythmia which is associated with lv dysfunction is atrial fibrillation and the incidence of associated left ventricular dysfunction in atrial fibrillation is from 25 to 75% depending upon various studies now there is a study which is done by uh, which is published in gic in which all patients who are referred for radio frequency ablation and they have evaluated their lv function and on the basis of that they has point that 2.7% patients who are referred for radio frequency ablation are having tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy now the tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy has been reported in about 10% of patients with atrial tachycardia especially in a younger age and the most important cause which is a pgrt which appears to be highest association with tachycardia cardiomyopathy and up to range of 20 to 50%. Now why there is there is a three important mechanism which can lead to myocardial dysfunction. The first and foremost is when there is an irregular RR interval and which is seen in atrial fibrillation 
second important basic cause is dyssynchrony and dyssynchrony is because of pvc because of bundle branch block because of right ventricle pacing and third important thing is because of rapid atrial and ventricle rates which is seen in supraventricular tachycardia and some of idiopathic ventricular tachycardia now these are various causes of tachycardia and due cardiomyopathy and you can list all supraventricular arrhythmias in this category and also the ventricular arrhythmias and the frequent vpc is one of the most important cause and rvotvt ventricle pacing at higher rates ilvt they are some of other causes of tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy now risk factor which contributes to development and degree of myocardial dysfunctions are what is a type of arrhythmia some arrhythmia is more prone for this what is a heart rate it is a high heart rate or it is 100 per minute or 110 150 higher the heart rate more chances of lv dysfunction duration of tachycardia it's also very very important a long tachycardia can lead to cardiomyopathy now underlying structural heart disease is another important thing with comorbidities if you are diabetic hypertensive and concomitant drug therapy may contribute as well when atrial fibrillation usually the frequency of lv dysfunction which is induced by atrial fibrillation and it depends upon two important thing a pre existing lv dysfunction if you have an atrial fibrillation you have further reduction of left ventricle function clinically because you don't know you see think that this atrial fibrillation is because of lv dysfunction so clinically it is usually under recognized but if you have no heart disease you have a atrial fibrillation with serious LV, severe lv dysfunction it is uncommon but not rare and second important thing atrial fibrillation with mild to moderate lv dysfunction is probably the most common thing which we see in our clinical practice it is important to recognize that resting heart rate are poor indicator of overall heart rates in patient with atrial fibrillation because the heart rate response to exercise may vary and it is very well known that patient who has well controlled resting heart rate may have a rapid ventricular response with minimum activity and develop tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy so you have to see the uh, heart rate response to minimal exercise in these patients now what are the arrhythmia burden and myocardial dysfunction now it is being speculated there is no clear cut guideline in which we can say this must arrhythmia burden or this heart rate may lead to tachycardia induced or arrhythmia induced cardiomyopathy it is being clued that if your heart rate is persistently more than 100 per minute it may lead to tachycardia cardiomyopathy phenylalanine says that chronic tachycardia which lasts for more than 10 to 15% of each day so he has given a cut off if the tachycardia lasts more than 10% each day with an atrial rate which is more than 150 it is a predictor of tachycardia cardiomyopathy now for pvcs it is very very important now we all believe that pvcs can lead to tachycardia cardiomyopathy so what is the burden you ever practically everybody will have a pvc so it is there's various uh, studies which has shown that pvc we burden approximately some say more than 16 some say more than 24% but we believe that if your pvc burden is more than 20% then there is higher chances of developing tachycardia and due cardiomyopathy the ashurvadam study which has clearly says that if you have more than 20000 pvc per day and which is of more than one morphology it can lead to lv dysfunction now if you have a cardiac dilatation in tic is typically accompanied by this the decreased contractile state with severe impairment of systolic function usually it leads to dilatation of all the four chambers right and left ventricle wall thinning but uh, the thinning is not as severe as you see in idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy but usually no change is myocardial mass he has markedly elevated because all the finding of congestive heart failure decreased cardiac output ele elevated systemic vascular resistance everything is there in tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy 
the precise mechanism which is responsible for the contractile dysfunction and its structural changes in tick are not fully understood this proposed mechanism may lead to dilated what are the various uh, causes of tachycardia uh, induced cardiomyopathy there are several proposed mechanism and they are like myocardial energy depletion and impaired energy utilization there is a myocardial ischemia oxidative stress abnormal calcium handling because of increased heart rate and there is some genetic predisposition which is also being seen in these type of patients now there is lot of molecular changes uh, which occurs in these patients reduce myocardial protein content decrease sodium potassium atpase activity reduce tubulin mrna and apoptosis so these all mechanism has been seen at molecular level in these patients when you see a microscopy of myocardium in tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy these are various things which has been shown like myocyte lengthening disruption of basement membrane loss of myocytes myofibril misalignment reduced myocardial capillaries and increased ca capillary myocyte distance uh these all are things which are seen in microscopic level now this is very very important because neuro hormonal activation result is marked elevation in plasma catecholamines anp levels renin and aldosterone levels which further leads to worsening of left ventricle function in this patient usually the contractile reserve in response to inotropic agent is diminished the decrease the cardiac sympathetic response have also been observed in these patients so the fenella in 1996 described this as two types a pure form and impure form and a pure form when chronic tachycardia inserts normal myocardium being the sole mechanism of functional deterioration so if you can prove that this is because of only tachycardia then it is pure form and when the above criteria is not met it is a impure form now what is the various clinical mani ma manifestation but tachycardia and cardiomyopathy may manifest at any age and usually it takes 3 to 120 days to develop lv dysfunction when you have a tach tachycardia which is leading to tachycardia and cardiomyopathy signs and symptoms as usual of congestive heart failure baseline echo will always show lv dysfunction and if you so if you do the 24 hour ecg monitoring then a significant amount of arrhythmia burden may give a clue that this may be a tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy now clinical presentation will be continue even if an arrhythmia is identified concomitantly with depressed myocardial function to establish the cause effective relationship is always not feasible until you prove that you treat arrhythmia and lv function improves in the majority of the cases a definite definite diagnosis can only be established with the condition that elimination of arrhythmia result in functional and structural improvement many times we also see that when the lv dysfunction improve it may be possible that this atrial fibrillation is because of lv dysfunction and when ld lv dysfunction improves because of some other cause af disappears and the patient will never come into the af so sometimes it is very difficult to give a clear cut association in these patients there is no specific test or markers which can diagnose tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy this is only your clinical high index of suspicion a proper history and a clinical features remains the only available tool to diagnose this entity now this is very much seen that these patients usually do not have a very large heart and that is because it is more rapidly progressing and there is lot of cut off being given uh, that beyond that usually don't diagnose tachycardia cardiomyopathy so in general these patients have a less dilated ventricle now this, there was a study which is done by pelink which says that to differentiate between dilated cardiomyopathy idiopathic and tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy you check the myocardial contractile reserve by giving low dose of dobutamine so if the ejection fraction improves markedly it is basically because of tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy and usually in idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy the lv function 
does not improve a lot now this is very very important assessment of if you cannot collaborate your resting finding but assessment of exercise heart rate and 24 hours whole term monitoring sometime give a very good clue that this patient might having lv dysfunction because of this arrhythmia now what are the treatment option which are available the most prime thing is you have to normalize the heart rate you can do by either a rate control or rhythm control this is the only two important thing but the most important is a rate control is more effective uh, sorry the rhythm control is more effective than rate control so try to achieve a rhythm control in these patients but if you cannot control the uh, rhythm then control the rate especially in patients of atrial fibrillation now the first and foremost important thing which we should remember till the time patient is symptomatic and having lv dysfunction and you are not able to control the arrhythmia or you are able to control the arrhythmia but patient is still symptomatic treat as dilated cardiomyopathy so give all drugs which which you gives in a patients of idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy so this is an basic a uh, a uh, uh, chart if you have a sinus tachycardia and because of thyrotoxicosis which is leading to your lv dysfunction give beta blocker and treat your thyrotoxicosis if you have atrial fibrillation with rapid ventricular rate the most important thing the rhythm control by either uh, ablation or antiarrhythmic drugs and if you cannot do it do a rate control and if you cannot do rate control properly with the drugs you can do a av jung av nodal ablation and putting a pacemaker in these patient <coughs> for atrial flutter i think radio frequency ablation is a treatment of choice for atrial tachycardia radio frequency ablation is a treatment of choice and there are very few uh, atrial tachycardia which i think it is less than 5% which you cannot ablate i think anti arrhythmic drugs may have a role especially when they are in a very small children so first you always try with anti arrhythmic drugs in a very small children and if not then again uh, radio frequency ablation is a drug of choice whether it is a sometime rapid atrial and ventricular pacing which is known as pacemaker mediated tachycardia now in a current generation pacemaker we rarely seen a pacemaker mediated tachycardia but in older pacemaker it is often a mis entity svt yes definitely if you have a incessant svt or idiopathic ventricular tachycardia no doubt radio frequency ablation with a success rate of more than 98% is a treatment of choice now this is a this is a meta analysis of all these studies in which they have compared atrial fibrillation rhythm versus rate control and now it always shows that if you control the rhythm the improvement of ejection fraction is more as you com compare you control the rate now one important entity which is known as pvc induced cardiomyopathy because it is always missed misdiagnosed and inappropriately treated because we don't believe that pvc can lead to cardiomyopathy but now it is a proven entity how can you differentiate whether this pvc is because of cardiomyopathy or this cardiomyopathy is because of excessive burden of pvc and there are some clues cardiomyopathy which is resulting in pvc is basically a older patient known heart disease lot of comorbidities like cad then there may be segmental hypokinesia or regional valve motion abnormality you can find in mri significant scar the pvc frequency is usually less it is less than 5% and these pvc which is because of cardiomyopathy are having a multifocal pvc pattern usually pvcs are more than two or three varieties and qrs morphology is non specific but if this cardiomyopathy is because of pvc then uh, then you have a uh, then these are the various things which you see in your they are usually in a young patient no comorbidity global hypokinesia there is no regional valve motion abnormality and usually pvc's burden is more than 10% uh, or it may be 20% and they are usually monomorphic and especially coming from right ventricle outflow tract or epicardial means outflow tract pvcs and epicardial pvcs are more likely to have cardiomyopathy 
ये टाइम कोर्स ऑफ इंप्रूवमेंट इट इज एक्सट्रीमली वेरिएबल रिकवरी में भी कंप्लीट पार्शियल और टोटली एब्सेंट इट मे टेक थ्री मंथ सिक्स टू एट मंथ देर मे बी इनकम्प्लीट रिकवरी इन सम पेशेंट and there may be a complete recovery in some patients and this is an algorithm which is usually proposed if you have an lv dysfunction it's a basically dilated cardiomyopathy initiate heart failure treatment look for ecgs if it is tachycardia pvc burden is more than 10 then treat it as a tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy otherwise treat them as a idiopathic dilated cardiomyopathy so to summarize my talk the tachycardia induced or arrhythmia induced cardiomyopathy refer to myocardial dysfunction in response to high atrial ventricular rate and now i will say in response to bradycardia also this is this is possible arrhythmia induced tachycardia cardiomyopathy in uh, as basically maybe because of increased heart rate or maybe because of dyskinesia these are potentially fully reversible cause of cardiomyopathy so these are listed as one of the reversible cause of cardiomyopathy when you treat them in absence of large prospective study the exact incidence and prevalence is unknown but we we now can say that it is not in very uncommon prospective diagnosis may be sometimes difficult because uh, until you treat arrhythmia and uh, lv improve you cannot label them and uh, this is the uh, arrhythmia which i always say look at it ablate it treat it and you will have a improved ejection fraction and heart failure may be cured thank you very much yeah uh thanks uh, dr uh, yadav for a uh, overview of a uh, tachycardia induced cardiomyopathy I think it's a uh, time to move to the next topic uh, dr anger uh dr stitchit you would like to introduce the next speaker and the topic dr joseph Dr. Joseph. Uh, yes. Yeah. Dr. Joseph. Yeah. Yeah. Next topic is uh, on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy by Dr. Sanjay Mittal. Over to Dr. Sanjay. Yeah. Thank you, Dr. Joseph. I think uh, I am visible here. Uh, my slides are visible. Is it? Yeah. 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 Okay. So. Uh, i am going to talk on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy this is another of the big issues uh, i start with the case because this is a case based uh, study uh, i had a patient 70 years old man who had chest discomfort for 3 4 years breathless non exertion for year, one year and currently he presented in nit class 2 to 3 and three episodes of hemoptysis last one month no history of syncope angiography was done two months back which was uh, normal non diabetic normal tensive bp was okay 130 by 70 pulse rate was 62 this is the ecg we find left bundle branch block pulse rate is not high sinus rhythm um and this is the echocardiogram you can see uh, which is very conspicuous that the uh, the ivs is di uh, thickened here the diameter was 2.1 cm and the posterior wall here was just 1.1 so this is a classical A manifestation of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, there was some degree of aortic regurgitation but not significant and some mitral regurgitation of mild degree which consistently uh, was with the symptomatic status if you look at the uh, four chamber view the contractility was definitely depressed uh, the ejection fraction calculated was about 30% uh ventricle was dilated 5.4 cm la was dilated hugely 85 mm was the total volume trace mitral regurgitation and mild uh, tr also was noted as uh, you can see on the uh, parallel side um the echo did show uh, there was a pseudo normal restrictive mitral inflow pattern and the e to e prime you can see hardly the septal uh, e prime is hardly there the e to e prime ratio was as high as 27 suggestive of significant left ventricular systolic dysfunction you can also see that in the uh, gls uh, bullseye plot uh, the gls was just 5.7 minus 5.7 very low and the pa pressures were very high of 73 this correlated with a burnt out phase of uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy so this leads to us a few questions how frequent is the situation of heart failure in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, 
what are the reasons uh, of such situations what is the prognosis how do we manage and what do we have a suggestion in the guidelines so uh, the first question i would like to say is uh, this is the recent paper uh, which is which was uh, published in 25th of march 2020 uh, that nearly expected 20 million people of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are there worldwide 10% of them are identifiable 90% of them are not identifiable roaming around in the crowd we do not know who is who is not because they are not symptomatic only 6% of people do have uh, symptoms and uh, some of them majority of them would have chronic uh, either syncopal symptoms but majority of them would have some effort intolerance so the symptomatic status in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is small and as we go ahead with these slides you'll understand what i am trying to communicate that hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can present with so many variable situations so because it is a focus on heart failure let's see a uh, heart failure what are the causes and how can uh, chronic heart failure present in heart hypertrophic cardiomyopathy first of all it is the most frequent uh, symptoms um, almost uh, 6% of people would have uh, heart failure symptoms most of the majority of them who have symptoms hypertrophic stage you can heart, have heart failure with preserved ejection fraction and this is mainly because of the small ventricular size and stiff ventricles which leads to high filling pressures and high left atrial overload this leads to failure diastolic failure the other reason could be because of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction and this leads to significant mitral regurgitation and mitral regurgitation means reflection of left ventricular systolic pressure into the left atrium and that's why the pulmonary venous congestion the third reason could be atrial fibrillation Uh, which leads to loss of atrial kick and atrial kick is so very important in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for ventricular filling and loss of that can lead to heart failure the other stage is a, a advanced burnt out stage when the ventricle despite uh, all of these things maybe microvascular ischemia and so many other factors leads to dilatation phase and this is easy to understand because it is progressive and it is because of cardiac remodeling dilatation of ventricle and due to myocardial fibrosis the left ventricular systolic and diastolic function is depressed in these patients and ventricular dilatation and also increased wall stress and thickness can lead to uh, heart failure the final uh, type is restrictive phenotype where the ventricle is too stiff and this leads to diastolic dysfunction and heart failure um so these are the three methods and uh, a diagrammatic description um would be if there is left ventricular outflow tract obstruction this leads to two things one is there is because of sam an improper co uh, coaptation of the mitral valve leading to mitral regurgitation this leads to mr left atrial overload and uh, functional class uh, 3 or 4 heart failure pulmonary hypertension can happen with this the other side is that left ventricular systolic pressures would be high this leads to heart failure because of improper ventricular filling and high la overload and the other thing which can happen is microvascular ischemia this again leads to dysfunctional myocardium and uh, uh, symptoms of heart failure and the final thing is impaired left ventricular filling reduced cardiac output and stroke volume again symptomatic heart failure because of reduced cardiac output if you come to the acute heart failure presentation which is not so much frequent with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, the commonest reason is atrial fibrillation for that supraventricular tachycardia and sustained ventricular tachycardia also could be reason but atrial fibrillation is the commonest reason for precipitation of heart failure in acute setting acute decompensated heart failure Uh, acute mitral regurgitation could also be there because of cordial rupture because of high ventricular systolic pressures or infective endocarditis both of them can lead to acute mr and heart failure acute heart failure myocardial ischemia we should not forget either microvascular ischemia or concomitant cardiovascular disease uh, can cause this thing comorbidities as far as anemia and hyperthyroidism also should not be ruled out and they can cause precipitation of heart failure in acute settings this is just the description of people of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy uh, to distinguish those who had heart failure symptoms versus those who had no heart failure symptoms 
If you see, atrial fibrillation was much more frequent in heart failure symptoms, 64% of them in this particular study. Uh, female genders, 54% more frequently to have uh, heart failure. Significant mitral degradation was almost uh, uh, two times more frequent in heart failure settings. And high, uh, large LA and large LA volume index is also frequently found in heart failure. This is something which can pre-monate a person of having heart failure symptoms. But can we predict heart failure in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy if the person is not symptomatic? So this is a beautiful study which I could uh, figure out uh, in this particular study, the patients with, uh, were followed up uh, for their symptomatic status and LVOT obstructions. So they categorized the patients into three categories. Those who had no obstruction, there were about 30% of them. Those who had a rest obstruction, 37% of them. And provocable, uh, or that means by, by well salva or dobitamine stress echo, 33% uh, had provocable exercise induced or provocable ischemia. Total of 70% having inducible ischemia or inducible gradients versus uh, non obstructive or 30. So, if they followed the patients up for nine years, they found <clears throat> those who had non obstructive nature, they did not become symptomatic majority. Almost 90% remained asymptomatic at 90 years, nine years. Those who had uh, provocable ischemia, that means on stress test, also uh, about 85% uh, uh, remained asymptomatic uh, at nine years. However, those who had LBOT obstruction, they had the higher, highest risk of development of heart failure symptoms over the period of nine years follow-up. And this is a p-value which was very highly significant. Almost 50% of those people who had LBOT gradients would develop symptoms over the nine years period. Uh, a word about the stages. So that is how uh, the progress of the hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is from a non-hypertrophic stage where there's no gradient, no symptoms. The people slowly, slowly develop symptoms because uh, uh, hypertrophy. So there is a classic phenotype where a majority of the people would be there where there's hypertrophy. Ejection fraction is very well maintained, but there has no symptoms. However, at a some point in time, there is adverse remodeling which starts the prevalence is about 15% and the extent fraction starts to drop down 50 to 65%. And at this point in time, the GLS and LA dilation and diastolic dysfunction can pick them up. The final stage is overt dysfunction, systolic dysfunction, which is not so frequent, only 5 to 10% of patients when ejection fraction is less than 50%. So if you compare these four stages, you can see obviously the ejection fraction keeps on dropping as the stage advances vertically. You can see stage one, two, three, and four. The MRI, if you do the MRI, you can see the uh, there is more scarring. There's no scarring in stage one, five, less than 5%, 10 to 15%, and 25 to 50%. In the burnt out stage, there's huge bit of scarring. However, if there is less scarring, this is a better prognosis. Coronary microvascular dysfunction also gets increased as the uh, stage increases. Symptomatic status, again, uh, there's no rocket science as the stage increases, uh, deteriorates uh, in symptomatic status. Functional limitation is there. Uh, filling pattern, again, the diastolic filling pattern, again, stage one and two would have hardly any symptoms and uh, diastolic relaxation of normality at best. However, as the stage advanced to three and four, there is uh, uh, tissue Doppler evidence of restrictive mitral physiology and uh, filling patterns, uh, diastolic dysfunction would appear. LVOT obstruction, 70% uh, would be there in uh, stage two and none in stage one. However, as the stage advances, reverse remodeling, uh, remodeling starts, the LVOT gradients also may start getting down as was there in our case. Also, the atrial remodeling, the atrial size also keeps on increasing as the stage increases. Atrial fibrillation chances also keeps on increasing. So minimum um, in stage one and maximum very common in stage four. That's what I was saying. The ventricular tachycardia uh, chances also keep on increasing. Uh, the chances of sudden death also keeps on increasing. If you can see here, 
In stage two, there is 0.5 to 1% per year, and this goes up to 10% per year if it is stage four. So that is my, it, it is a classical indication to put an ICD if there is LV dysfunction, because these people are very high risk of dying suddenly. A problem is of management, especially in heart failure situation in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This is what I could gather from ESC guidelines in 2014, and there's hardly any change since then. People who have heart failure presentation in IG class two or four in hypertrophic setting, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy setting, we first look at two things, which is whether it is in the presence of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction, or there's no left ventricular outflow tract or minimal left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. And this is minded whether it at rest or after well salva or provocation. If there is a significant gradient, then management of left ventricular outflow tract obstruction by medicines, beta blockers, or by uh, interventions, the, uh, which we'll talk later, would help these patients to solve their problems of heart failure. If the person is having less than 50 millimeters of gradient at rest or provocable, then we look at atrial fibrillation. If there is atrial fibrillation, controlling the rate, rhythm um, uh, is best, and anticoagulants is a must in all the people. There is no role of chat drugs to score here because every person who has hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and is in atrial fibrillation is a very high risk of uh, uh, thromboembolic episodes and should be anticoagulated. Um, the other side is if there is no atrial fibrillation, we look at ejection fraction. If the ejection fraction is more than 50%, the line of action is again the same, beta blockers or verapamil, deltaism, uh, low dose loop diuretics for symptomatic relief. These are the things which we can give. However, if the ejection fraction is less than 50% and no significant gradients, beta blockers still the first line of treatment, uh, ACE inhibitors, MRAs, no verapamil or deltaism here, and loop diuretics just on the line of significant LV systolic dysfunction or heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. If the people do not respond to that, then we think about heart transplantation specifically if the person has no significant LVOT obstruction. A word about medical management. <clears throat> this is again from the same guidelines. <clears throat> Uh, we are talking about people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy now landing up with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. So we talk about ACE inhibitors. ACE inhibitors are class 2A indication with the level of evidence C. It is uh, not as su superlative as for other heart FRFs. However, uh, all the people with less than 50%, it is indicated. And it is known that this reduces heart failure hospitalization and premature death but the evidence is not so robust. Beta blockers, ejection fraction less than 50% with, without left ventricular outflow tract obstruction. Heart failure, uh, hospitalization gets reduced and heart uh, premature death also gets reduced. But again, the level of evidence is C and uh, uh, recommendation is class 2A. Loop diuretics mainly for symptomatic control uh, and they thus can reduce heart failure hospitalization, but be very cautious, very watchful that reducing the ventricular volume can lead to precipitation of LVOT gradients. And that's something which we should be watching for when we're giving ACE inhibitors in a burnt out stage. Sometimes they can recover and they can land up with left ventricular outflow tract gradients at that time. MRAs, again, for heart failure, hospitalization, and premature death, just like uh, the HFREF syndromes, minimal role of digoxin, very cautious specifically if there is LVOT obstruction. Without LV ob uh, obstruction and in atrial fibrillation, it may be given, but the level of uh, recommendation is class 2B. If we talk about HFPEF, when ejection fraction is more than 50%, um, NYJ class 2 to 4 symptoms, the uh, indication is beta blockers, verapamil and deltaism, Indications class 2A and level of evidence to C. And uh, there, is, there should be no evidence of resting of provocative uh, gradients. This helps in relieving heart failure symptoms, only heart failure symptoms, no mortality benefit. Low dose loop diuretics for just heart failure symptoms management and level of evidence is 2A and C. Be very cautious that there is no inducement of provocable gradients here. 
a word about atrial fibrillation. Atrial fibrillation is very common. As I said, one in five uh, of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients would have atrial fibrillation. Uh, it is four to six times more common than uh, compared general population and uh, carries eightfold higher risk of a uh, stroke as compared to the general population and along with the chances of hemodynamic decompensation. The risk factors are large left atrium, uh, poor NYHA class and higher age, uh, which should be watched for just like any other atrial fibrillation. Early rhythm restoration may have a beneficial effect, but uh, we should act early because atrial fibrillation is not well tolerated in heart failure. A word about um, uh, the septal ablation and uh, hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy related uh, myomectomy. Um, today, myomectomy definitely has overbalance, especially in younger people, healthier people, longer life expectancy, uh, those people who have higher uh, gradients and uh, greater wall thickness, the septal thickness, and coexisting structural, structural disease. However, if there is a higher risk situation, then uh, septal ablation may be a, a better thing uh, to be planned about. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, the surgical treatment, if you talk about, uh, if we have obstructive uh, situation at rest or provocable, the person's symptoms are assessed, class three or four, myomectomy or uh, alcohol septal ablation can be thought about. Heart failure reversal is possible. Uh, if this is not possible, then we are thinking about heart transplant. However, if there is non-obstructive disease, majority of them would not have symptoms or mild symptoms. However, 10% may still have symptoms. And if they have symptoms, try medications. If the person remains symptomatic despite medications, heart transplant seems to be the only option at that stage. ICD, uh, obviously, as I said, is very important because a person with LV systolic dysfunction developed with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy is a very high risk of a certain cardiac death and should be implanted ICD. Uh, so I conclude my uh, talk here with certain messages. Heart failure in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is multifactorial and common, especially uh, the diastolic heart failure. HEFPEF, have mid-ref and have ref. All situations can be observed in hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy, especially with advancing stage of heart, uh, heart disease. Heart failure in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is a bad prognostic sign. Uh, medical therapy improves mortality and morbidity, but the role is less remarkable as a non-hypertrophic cardiomyopathy-related heart failure. Atrial fibrillation is a common cause of acute decompensation and should be treated along with anticoagulants uh, and uh, early rhythm control is preferable. However, if not possible, then rate control is mandatory. <clears throat> Heart failure onset increases the risk of sudden cardiac death and ICD is uh, mandatory. Uh, if left ventricular outflow tracts in obstruction is detected, surgical myomectomy improve survival and symptoms. And we must not forget about the genetic counseling if we detect a person with hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. As we all know, this is an autosomal dominant uh, trait and we should uh, track the siblings of that patient. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sanjay Mittal. Now, the next topic is on chemotherapy-induced cardiomyopathy by Dr. Justin Paul. Is uh, Dr. Justin? Yeah, I'm there. Yeah. yeah, Dr. Justin? Yes, sir. I'm here. Yeah, we're moving into the new subspecialty field of cardiology, cardio oncology. So, our friend Dr. Justin Paul, international cardiologist from Chennai, will talk about this. <clears throat> uh, are you able to see my slides? Yes, yes. Uh, good evening, one and all of you. It's my privilege to spend this uh, evening with you, sharing some inputs on chemotherapy-induced heart failure. I thank uh, the Heart Failure Association of India for having given me this opportunity to uh, share uh, on this area. So cardio-oncology is a sort of a growing field. Uh, let's explore 
and rather neglected field. We have more and more patients living, living for a longer period of time, newer and more powerful cardiac drugs being identified. Their survival is increasing. However, the coordination between the oncologists and the cardiologists is yet to improve, <coughs> commensurate to the rate of improvement happening in either fields. So this is the field that uh, what we are entering. So let us understand what exactly is happening between heart failure and cancer. This slide appears quite difficult, but uh, let me help you walk through the slide. This talks about the relationship between uh, cancer and heart failure. Some of the cancers like carcinoid can lead to myocardial fibrosis, and uh, this can lead to heart failure. Some of the cancers like amyloidosis can lead to myocardial infiltration and direct toxicity and lead to heart failure. Just Myeloid can leukemia you, can lead to in, heart failure. Just one second. Can you make the full screen? We cannot see the slides properly. Make it full screen. Can you? Make the slides full screen. What am I doing? Okay, let me check. Upload again. So share again and show it full screen. You're not sharing Justin right now. No. Okay, one minute. Okay. I'm sorry about yeah. that. Are you seeing now? Yeah, and now you have to make mm -hmm. it, you know, um, uh, yeah, present. Perfect. Is it okay now? Yeah, yeah, okay. So I'm sorry, I didn't know this was uh, okay. happening. Yeah. <clears throat> okay, I, I think uh, I touched upon this. Some of the cancers can produce uh, like carcinoid or uh, amyloidosis can directly lead to heart failure. And the same story with myeloid leukemia. Radiation therapy can lead to heart failure. Some of the chemotherapy can lead to heart failure through various mechanisms. <clears throat> Some of the complications of cancer like sepsis, infective endocarditis, pulmonary embolism, pulmonary hypertension, they all can lead to heart failure. Some of the risk factors are common for both the cancers and heart failure like diabetes, hypertension, nutritional deficiency. So as a result, they often coexist. <clears throat> In fact, the newer concept that has come is a bidirectional relationship between <clears throat> cancer and heart failure. We very well are going to talk about this area where cancer can lead to heart failure, but we need to understand that heart failure can also lead to cancer as per some of the studies in Danish National Registry and uh, in the British uh, data. They have found that more patients with heart failure are having cancer than the general population. Maybe uh, we probably need to look into our registries in India and find out whether if this data is okay are uh, right in Indian population too. So if you look at uh, the cancer uh, chemotherapy induced uh, cardiac failure, chick, we have about 1.5 million Indians will be newly diagnosed with cancer in 2020 this year. 69% of these survivors will have a five year life expectancy due to advances in early detection and treatment of cancer. Out of the survivors of those more than 50 years of age, almost 50% will develop cardiovascular disease during the lifespan. So in fact, cardiovascular disease is almost competing to be the number one cause of death in uh, cancer patients. So what are the guidelines we have in managing uh, chick? What we really find is we have only seven guidelines that touch upon this area. Only two, there's AAC and EACI and EAC cancer treatment or touching specifically on this area, but they are not guidelines, they're only position statements or expert consensus telling us the lack of data available in this area. So coming to the cancer therapy and effects on cardiovascular system, it could be a direct effect on the heart or effect on the coagulation system or effect on the blood vessel. What we are going to talk today is effect on the heart and in this particular area, we are not going to talk about cardiac arrhythmia, vasospasm, spasm, or occlusion. We are going to talk about chemotherapy-induced heart failure. 
Now, these are the various chemotherapies, associated cancer therapies, associated with heart failure, and dysfunction. To put it in another way, here you find the anthracyclines or HER2 inhibitors, mitotic inhibitors, alkylating agents, uh, TKIs, immune modulators, all of these can produce cardiotoxicity in various ways. Let us see how we can see in a simpler way. You can put them together for the sake of simplicity and practical usefulness as there are two types of chemotherapy induced cardiac failure, type one chick and type two chick. So if you look at the mechanisms, the type one is due to free radical formation, oxidative stress, and myocardial death. The biopsy will show you a lot of vacuoles, necrosis, and disarray. Whereas in type two, it is only due to signaling issues and there is no ultrastructural abnormalities. The next difference will be the type one is irreversible because of the cell, whereas type two is likely to be reversible. And as further, if you re-challenge it in type two, it is possible that it is more safer than type one. And lastly, the most important difference is that type one is cumulative. The total dose the patient is going to receive in the lifetime is going to be responsible for the chick. This is predominantly showed by doxorubicin group of drugs. Whereas the type two, <clears throat> where it is not dose related, the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, whether it is a MAP tyrosine kinase inhibitors like trastuzumab or small molecule TKIs like imatinib, this form the type two. Now this type one drug, the anthracyclines, it was called adriamycin as it was first isolated along the shores of Adriatic Sea. Later, to remove the term uh, mycin, which is confusing as an antibiotic, they renamed it as doxorubicin. And this doxorubicin is what we are looking at today. Now, what it does is, it is basically a topoisomerase 2A inhibitor, which is there in the cancer cells, but it also inhibits the 2B in the myocardium. And this leads to DNA damage and mitochondrial dysfunction and ultimately cell death. So is it possible to prevent it? There are new drugs that have come. Deferoxone is a old drug that is now found to be useful in inhibiting this unholy relationship between anthracyclines and topoisomerase 2B, and thus probably can reverse or reduce some of the damages. Now, what is it due to, what are the risk factors for anthracycline-induced cardiomyopathy? As early as 1970, one half, even before the era of uh, echocardiogram, he look, look, found that when the dose exceeds 650 milligram, the patient develops clinical heart failure. This has been validated in multiple studies, and now we know that when the dose exceeds 400 or even 350, the risk of chick increases a lot. In addition to the cumulative dosage, the dosing schedule does matter. If the patient re re uh, received a radiation therapy or other concomitant cardiotoxic agents, the risk is still high. So there are some patient-related factors as well. If the age is more than 65, the odds ratio for developing chick is almost 2.25. Coexisting CAD gives an odd ratio of 2.21, very high risk. Female sex has a higher risk. Pre-existing diabetes and hypertension, obesity, all these risk factors, our routine cardiovascular risk factors are also risk factors for chemotherapy-induced heart failure. So how do we avoid this? We keep the lowest cumulative dose possible and we can choose other anthracyclines instead of doxorubicin. If needed, the, we can talk to the oncologist and see in select patients whether they can choose any other anthracyclines rather than doxorubicin. And how we give is also important. A bolus infusion is highly cardiotoxic when compared to a 24-hour infusion. So it is always recommended to give by an infusion and not a bolus. A single large dolus is to be avoided and combination chemotherapy can be avoided. The latest information is the liposomal anthracyclines, which are larger molecules which does not come into the cardiac tissues, whereas it has a greater penetration in the tumor tissues, so it works only in the tumors. And as we talked earlier, deferoxamine in select patients can be helpful
in avoiding anthracycline related uh, cardiomyopathy now coming to the type 2 tkis whether it be a mad tkis like trastuzumab the we usually relate the type 2 to trastuzumab or herceptin induced cardiomyopathy though the other molecules mechanism is slightly different for convenience sake they are pooled as a type 2 uh, cardiomyopathy what happens in trastuzumab when it is given alone <clears throat> the her2 receptor normally it is necessary in cellular repair mechanisms when anthracycline is used when trastuzumab is combined with anthracycline this blocks the her2 receptors and as a result the cellular repair mechanisms are affected so when you combine these two the cardiomyopathy incidence is going to be very high in addition it has its own ways of creating myocardial damage when trastuzumab is given uh, it also enters the cardiomyocyte through the other uh, receptors simply uh, this is a simpler diagram than the earlier one these are other mechanisms technically speaking there are almost about eight types of uh, chemotherapy induced heart failure mechanisms but uh, Uh, this is just to tell that a lot of newer developments have come in terms of these medications that can prevent a uh, cardiomyopathy when we understand these mechanisms we can develop uh, new drugs that can prevent this mechanisms so what exactly is this uh, chemotherapy induced cardiac failure american society of echocardiography and eacvi define this as a decrease in ef more than 10% as long as the value comes down below 53% esmo and esc accept this definition except that they take a value less than 53% this is for both type 1 as well as type 2 if you look at the fda they have defined anthracycline induced cardiotoxicity as more than 20% decrease in lvef when the baseline lvef is normal somebody says the ef is 80 and tomorrow it is uh, 65 you know it is almost 15% decrease so for that reason the baseline ef is normal it is more than 20% and the baseline ef is abnormal a more than 10% decrease uh, is uh, suggestive of anthracycline cardiotoxicity whereas with trastuzumab what is mentioned is a decline in ef of 5% to less than 55% if the patient has symptoms and signs of heart failure if there is no sign of heart failure at least a 10% decrease is necessary and the total ef should be less than 55% what is to be understood is that it can be global or it can be regional in the septum not in other areas so how often can we screen European Society of Medical Oncology recommends a screening for patients with anthracyclines at baseline at 3 6 9 12 and 18 months for other patients it is baseline assessment and infrequent monitoring whereas if you look at the American Society of Clinical Oncology guidelines they recommend they don't really say that uh, the specify the intervals they only say that after treatment 6 and 12 months and if the patient has signs or symptoms of cardiac dysfunction then they suggest imaging biomarkers and referral to a cardiologist whereas our esc and acc heart failure guidelines they endorse echocardiography but they don't give any quality studies to help determine optimal screening intervals our oncology colleagues highlight the fact that no study has shown benefit of cardiac screening in chick prevention and cancer patients so why should we send patients for cardiac referral so there has been a difference of opinion between the oncologists and the cardiologists various cardiac bodies have given some guidelines say ejection fraction preferably by 3d if not by volumetric method we know the inter and intra observer variabilities that can happen GLS has been endorsed by AAC, EACVI, and ACO. And when they say that a subclinical dysfunction, a decrease in absolute value by more than fifteen percent, is suggestive of subclinical LV dysfunction. 
or a reduction in GLS more than 10% from the baseline at three months, this can predict a reduction in EF at six months with a good sensitivity and specificity, which is quite reasonable. The global circumferential and radial strains are also useful. They are subject to low consistency and very low reproducibility, so they generally are not recommended. So both AC and EACVI recommend that when you're reporting an echocardiogram in a patient with the cancer chemotherapy, we need to give 3D LVEF, GLS, RV TAPSI, S prime and FAC. If you're not able to give GLS, we need to give the medial and the lateral S prime and the MAPSI. So this is the recommendation of ASC and EACVI. There are many studies which have looked at the diastolic parameters also, but as of now, they don't have any clinical value. So how often is routine echo? Is it necessary? This question is addressed in trastuzumab regimen, where they found that if you're using a trastuzumab regimen, routine echo every three months is excessive and may not be necessary. And they went on to highlight that attempt to prevent cardiotoxicity are unjustified. But if you're, com if you're using a combination therapy, then monitoring and pharmacological prevention is reasonable. This is the summary they have given. What are the biomarkers you can use? Troponin is the only reasonably validated biomarker. And how often you do at baseline and at the end of every cycle to detect early onset LV dysfunction. Other biomarkers, we have data on HSCRP, NT-PRO, BNP, and myeloperoxidase, but they are not validated here. There are some institutions that are using cardiac MRI for screening and they have their own disadvantages in the cost. So how are we going to identify a patient who's going to develop uh, cardiomyopathy due to drugs? You have a couple of scoring systems that this I found was a good score. So you have a medication related factor and patient related factors. And putting all these scores and adding the number of patient related risk factors if you have more than six, you have very high risk of cardiotoxicity. There was another score called modified ESA score. This is also tested in a couple of uh, smaller studies and found reasonably helpful. So what about drugs? When we find a high risk patient, are we justified in giving them some drugs? These are some of the smaller studies, 150 to 200 patients. They've, in one study, candesatin was helpful. The overcome study, enalapil and covidilol combo was helpful in preventing uh, patients going for chick. In perindopril and bisoprolol, both help decline in LVEF. In another study, covidilol was not helpful. These are small studies. I found two, three larger studies. This was a study which uh, tried lisinopril versus covidilol versus placebo. This is almost 500 patients. And what they really found was in the entire cohort, there was no big difference between placebo and any of these drugs. In the cohort where trastuzumab was only used, again, there was no benefit. Whereas if we use this in a patient, the trastuzumab and anthracyclines, there is significant benefit of either carudilol or lisinopril when compared to placebo. So they recommended when these drugs are combined, these drug uh, carbidilol or lisinopril can be used. This IQOS-1 study, about 200 patients, and they found that routine use of enalapril versus troponin-triggered use of enalapril. They check troponin every visit, and if there is an increase, they give enalapril. Up to a maximum dose of 10 milligram twice a day, starting from 2.5 twice a day. And they found that there was no difference between routine use as well as troponin triggered arm. So they concluded that a routine enalapril use in high risk patients may not be necessary. A troponin triggered strategy appears to be more convenient. We are not putting a lot of patients in uh, this arm. Only 26 patients had troponin elevation. So you can save 75% of the patients with the, uh, from unnecessarily being given enalapril. This was their opinion. This was a meta-analysis on a carvedilol study for uh, there were eight studies, totally 633 patients, 
and what they found that use of carbidolol was benef beneficial. And the quantum of LVF decrease was also less in carbidolol treated patients. So prophylactic administration of carbidolol in anthracycline treated cancer patients may reduce early onset LV dysfunction compared to placebo. Another interesting study that came a couple of, uh, I think last year, uh, MADID chick trial. For the device enthusiasts, this is another area. This found the patients who developed heart failure after chemotherapy. When you are using a CRT, there was a significant improvement in LV ejection fraction. As you can see, the LVF went on improving, and in every area you find that the total, there was <clears throat> almost a 10% increase in uh, LV ejection fraction. All subgroups got benefit. So now how are we going to survive, do the surveillance and manage the treatment? Prior to therapy, you look at the risk factors, cardiac risk factors, the patient related, and the oncological risk factors. Do some baseline imaging and decide the patient's a low risk or a high risk. If it's a low risk, straight away go for chemotherapy. If he has a higher risk, get a cardiac evaluation, do risk factor modifications, initiate ACE inhibitors and beta blockers or either of them. This is a little uh, unclear area. Evaluation for ischemia, not too sure. Dexterazone, we are still not too sure. There are some studies recommending it. Now, during drug therapy, do surveillance for herceptin and anthracycline. Every cycle, you check the biomarkers. And in imaging for herceptin 3, 6, 9, and 12 months, for anthracyclines, whenever you exceed every 50 milligram cumulative dose, about 240, or at the completion of 240 uh, milligram per meter squared, do the imaging. When, or whenever clinical situation warrants. If there are no change, leave it. Asymptomatic LV dysfunction, you can start ACE inhibitors and beta blockers. Statins are unclear. Symptomatic LV dysfunction, both are to be started. And about modifying the chemotherapy, uh, multidisciplinary approach needs to be done. A good discussion with the oncologist, looking at the benefits of continuing and harms of continuing the chemotherapy uh, needs to be discussed. Following chemotherapy, if you have a lower risk patients, at the therapy completion, have an echocardiogram done and no further imaging needed. If it's a medium or high risk patient, if it is anthracycline alone or with any of the other type two agents, 2D echo or 3D with strain at six to 12 months, then 18 months. But further surveillance benefit is not established. If it is only trastuzumab or any other imatinib like drugs, echo at the completion for the surveillance is really not beneficial. And why is that we are talking a lot about prognosis, I mean about uh, this chemotherapy induced heart failure. If you look at the prognosis, we just talked, Dr. Ambuch talked about the peripartum cardiomyopathy. It's a very lowest risk of cardiomyopathy if uh, you know timely recognized and managed. Whereas if you look at the Doxorubicin induced cardiomyopathy, it has one of the worst prognosis. So we really need to identify this patient uh, early. What do you do if you identify the patient has developed a chemotherapy induced cardiac failure? With, if it is a trastuzumab, it is quite easy. You can withhold for four weeks. And if you look at when do you decrease? If there is a decrease of more than 16% from treatment values, or more than 10% uh, from absolute decrease. When do you resume it? When the EF comes back to baseline, which is often the case, or less than 15% short of the baseline within four to eight weeks. With doxorubicin and heart failure, you need to discontinue. Asymptomatic LV dysfunction, what do we do? We really not uh, ha don't have very clear guidelines here. So what are the future perspectives that we are looking at? Specific clinical training programs for cardio-oncology specialization needs to be developed. I recommend this as an area of uh, training for the HFAI, where it can have a course, certification course like this, what we are doing for heart failure, you can do for cardio-oncology as well. 
Development of newer treatments, we are really looking at tailor-made approaches to identify high-risk patients, studies to introduce interventions to prevent, to formulate specific treatment, and any guidelines for individualizing patient, each patient treatment with support from genetic and molecular studies. These are the future perspectives that some research is ongoing. So to summarize, cardio-oncology is a developing field and every hospital treating cancers should give full support to develop this field. And I encourage angsters to enter into this area and cardiologists. Every heart failure expert has to understand the intricacies of chick and should be trained in its screening prevention and management. Every cancer patient going for treatment is a stage A heart failure patients, very important. And they need to give, receive aggressive risk factor optimization. It is highly neglected often. Oh, he has a cancer. Okay, why should we give statins or why should we give? So they should receive aggressive risk factor optimization. And all risk stratification should be done. And this therapy is extremely important. What has been found is the heart failure and dysfunction therapy is often second hearted. This has been found in many research registries. They should get full fledged guideline mandated heart failure therapy. Once the patient develops heart failure, the therapy is the same, whether it is water may be the origin. So, this is a very important area. Uh, I want uh, angsters to uh, have in mind that heart failure patients developing LV dysfunction and heart, I mean, uh, cancer patients developing LV dysfunction and heart failure should receive full therapy, should not have a second handed approach at all. So, thank you very much for your kind attention. This is just a beginning uh, in this area. Thank you very much. Thank you for suggesting. Uh, we go on to the questions now. Dr. Kabram, how many minutes we have? Uh, because it's taken uh, more time. So, if we can have 10 minutes, because one more talk for 20 minutes uh, is there. So, we can have yeah. 10 minutes discussion, then have the next talk. Then if okay. needed, we'll uh, have discussion on that. So we have 10 minutes. Uh, I'll just take up first two questions. The next two questions can be taken by Dr. Jayesh and Dr. Joseph. A question for uh, Dr. Ambush, Professor Ambush, right? Uh, one is uh, a natural history of uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy is one of the questions. Yeah, so uh, as I showed in that, after graph and uh, later Justin alluded to. Uh, so uh, peripartum cardiomyopathy, thankfully, is one of the better prognosis as compared to any other heart failure. Uh, and almost 50% of the patients should recover in uh, six months' time. Uh, and most of the recovery will happen in the six months' time. If your LV function is not recovered uh, in that period, then most of the time, not always, it's uh, irreversible. So I would say about half of the patients would recover completely. Uh, uh, another one fourth would have an intermediate recovery and one fourth generally go on to irreversible heart failure and end stage heart failure uh, subsequently. Can I add a small yeah. comment here, Dr. Ambuj? Sure, Justin, yeah. So in our registry, we have 42 patients with peripartum cardiomyopathy. We lost three patients, and almost 50% of the patients uh, completely recovered their normal ejection fraction, as uh, you rightly said. So the Tamil Nadu registry, I'll, I'll, I'll finally, is the ICMR sponsored study, and I'm sure that will give us uh, more light on um, pregnancy and heart failure. And uh, Justin is leading that, yeah. Uh, Dr. Professor Rakesh, has a question for you. Yes, uh, uh, I have plenty of questions. Yeah, I have plenty. Uh, you want to choose? You want to primary, choose? At present, is not a treatment of complete heart block, so don't okay. give it. Second <laughs> important thing: what is uh, the PVC burden? More than twenty percent means your total amount of ventricle ectopics versus total sinus rhythm. So, if your ventricle ectopics are more than twenty percent in a Holter monitor, it means burden is more than twenty percent. Yes. Sinus tachycardia okay. in case of thyrotoxicosis has been reported to lead to cardiomyopathy. There's no doubt about it. And Dr. Vishal's question that how will you differentiate that this 
VPC is not because of heart failure, or this VP is leading to heart failure. And I have given a beautiful chart for that. How to differentiate cardiomyopathy leading to VPC and VPC leading to cardiomyopathy? Then Dr. Ramachandra question: How to control heart rate? Yes, in a patient who has an LV dysfunction, and if you want to control the heart rate and atrial fibrillation, do not give calcium channel blocker. Beta blocker can be given. Lenoxin can be given, and emadron can be or added for short term. There is no harm, but avoid calcium channel blocker in those patients. Thank you, Professor Rakesh. Dr. Sanjay, would you like to pick up the next question? Yeah. There's a. That's a good question, Dr. Ram Chandra has asked me. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I came across with a family who has three children affected with HOCM. The eldest one died at age of 40 years because of a sudden cardiac death. Other two, one girl who has uh, angina on exertion, a left ventricular outflow tract gradient of 50 at rest, and the other child has 20 millimeters gradient, not symptomatic. So uh, there is no second thought that a uh, family history of young sudden death, 40 years or less, is a high risk of sudden death in uh, that person as well. So uh, ICD indication is there. As far as uh, medicines are concerned, beta blockers should be tried in this effort-induced angina for girl. And this may reduce the effort uh, heart rate and uh, the gradients and help the person's symptoms to settle down. The progress of LVOT gradients and the sudden cardiac death is not altered by uh, these drugs. Disopyramide can also be one of the drugs which can be added if the person remains symptomatic, especially with significant gradient rest. But we may, uh, we ha may have to remember that it increases QTC and uh, the dose is about 100 milligrams th three times a day or, or adjustable according to the QTC. Uh, finally, there are certain new drugs which are coming up uh, and uh, I think we'll have to wait for the results to come. For hexylene, uh, which is a fatty acid oxidation inhibitor, mavacamptane and uh, uh, NAC also is being used, uh, but I think we don't have them in the market for the particular indication. The other uh, question which was addressed is uh, by Dr. Kishore Aurangabad, the drug treatment for LVOT obstruction. I think this is covered uh, in the previous. Thank you very much. Some more questions are there? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think, uh, there was a question for Dr. Ambu Jiroi. What is the dose for the bromocryptine and uh, uh, yeah. Yeah, so, uh, you know, it's sort of very well established uh, indication for the initial, you know, landmark study uh, by uh, they have used it as 2.5 mg twice a day for two weeks and then 2.5 once a day for uh, six weeks. So that is others have also used it for a shorter duration for four weeks. In fact, the German study is compared one versus eight week and they found the eight week one was slightly better. So I think uh, we could stick to the pilot study which was done and it was 2.5 twice a day and then 2.5 once a day for four to six weeks. No problem. The continue, the continue. The concern, uh, one minute. There was a concern about, you know, there's a suppression of breast secretion. With yeah. yeah. So that should be a factor in our setup. We should not use uh, it. Yeah. Absolutely. So as I mentioned, you know, earlier, in fact, the European guidelines had uh, uh, discouraged uh, breastfeeding, but in our setups, breastfeeding has to continue. And as I said, bromocryptine is still a class 2B indication. But if you if you do, of course, use it, then you lose the benefits of breastfeeding. So that that is a call uh, which uh, every clinician uh, will have to take uh, understanding the benefits and the risks and, and discussing with the patient. As I said, it's not an established therapy. Uh, it still needs more clinical data, but uh, if, if we have to use it, then obviously you cannot be uh, having, uh, you'll have to forego the option of breastfeeding. And you have to add an anticoagulant too. And they have to, yes. And because, you know, bromocryptine increases vascular events. And uh, you, as I mentioned in my slides, you must uh, combine it with anticoagulation whenever bromocryptine is being used. I think uh, there was a question uh, for Dr. Jada also, I think, but uh, I think it's there or not. Is a diuretic choice, whether it makes a difference, whether you should continue with a furosemide or torsemide infusion? I think uh, 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 it is being told that uh, torsinamide causes less potassium depletion. Uh, 
but yeah. the cost difference is too much so if you are using frusamide i can say you can continue i never encourage yeah. tocinamide because of the cost uh, is too high but the advantage of tocinamide is the resistance gradually tachyphylaxis is less and the potassium sparing part is uh, more so this is two major advantages yeah practically what we have seen the furosemide uh, clinically more efficacy as compared to tocinamide what what we feel so uh, anybody has got important thing i will yeah. furosemide because the furosemide yeah. oral bioavailability is 40 to 50% and tocinamide is more than 90% so in oral definitely tocinamide yeah. will be more effective but i will i think we yeah, all yeah. believe furosemide is, is more better. effective than tocinamide we all yeah. agree yeah, but there is a meta analysis uh, just last year uh, i mean it's compiled of several small studies but uh, it actually surprisingly has shown cardiac mortality benefits with uh, tocinamide so that's a bit uh, something which we have to keep in mind and it clearly showed benefits of reducing uh, hospitalization so that is something which uh, is there in literature and has to be kept in mind thank you we come to the end of this question ask yeah. session the yeah. next session dr abra yeah i think i'll share my slide and he's going to talk to us about comorbid conditions impacting the patients with heart failure professor abra the senior internal cardiologist at apollo hospitals chennai okay uh here we go i hope i am audible and uh, visible to everybody and uh so the my topic is comorbidities in heart failure sleep disorders uh iron deficiency depression obesity so i'll be touching upon only four of them because each of them are big topics per se so i'll start with a case because today's flavor is case based discussion at this uh, 60 years old diabetic hypertensive uh high level executive who had an androl mi 3 years back he had a primary ptc had done to proximal lady uh, during mi year for 30% subsequently to remain at 34% he had a check and joe done stent uh, was patent and icd put and he was on importantly ramipril 5 mg metoprolol 50 mg spironolactone 25 mg this so he had uh, three guideline directed drugs and at least two of them were on at least 50% of guideline directed doses so quite good there pressure is okay heart rate is okay heart weight is 85 kilos and uh, he came for a review he there was no signs of fluid overload but he felt miserable he said he has got fatigue persistent chest tightness breathlessness he snores so what how do you manage this patient first of all we will do the test ejection fraction was 40% gls was not a bad minus 12 the dopsis echo was negative and you can see the hemodynamic biochemical tests were reasonable and nt probin was 91 this is important because like uh, like uh, they do not come into the paradigm or the dapage of inclusion criteria because nt probin was 91 hs drop i was 2.7 so what do you do with this person modify the current medication they are reasonably good medications because at least 50% of two uh, of guideline directed therapies and all three gdts are there add additional drugs like arnio sdlt2 uh, maybe may not because see the antiprogen is 91 consider alternate intervention like transplant believe me this person has consulted dr google and at that time cf was less than 35% and even thought of transplant make no change to the current treatment plan maybe and say okay everything is in your head go home or then he'll probably change the cardiologist as he had done and look for comorbidities worsening the symptoms and that is the talk today so there are comorbidities has been considered as the elephant in the room and uh, uh, because what is elephant in the room these are things which exist we know that we do not want to acknowledge it and we do not act on it and according to esc you can see a series of uh, comorbidities today's talk it will be about four which is highlighted in red let me start with sleep disordered breathing it is highly prevalent and 50% of heart failure patients have that you can see here and what is sleep disordered breathing that is important 
because still uh, like as cardiologists and general physicians they're not very sure and uh, so they can broadly divide it into two categories obstructive sleep apnea central sleep apnea or mixed variety and central sleep apnea you should understand is a neurological problem obstructive sleep apnea is an anatomical problem so there is a central sleep apnea can be of many types chain stroke respiration exercise induced oscillatory ventilation periodic breathing maybe regular irregular but importantly csa can be two types chain stroke respiration and non chain stroke respiration so broadly like uh, 50% of heart failure patient can have sleep disordered breathing it may be osa or csa csa can be chain stroke or non chain stroke we can see the picture here here what happens is osa patient tries to breathe but cannot due to airway obstruction patient stops breathing for 10 seconds and uh, more than 10 seconds and uh, like in osa there is a closed airway and uh, patient tries to breathe effort of breathing is there whereas in central sleep apnea there is no effort of breathing it just stops breathing for more than 10 seconds and it is an open airway so how do you differentiate if you see the is a polysomnography csa there is no effort of breathing you can see the thorax here there is no effort of breathing and there is apnea there is an obstructive sleep apnea there is effort of breathing but there is uh, there is apneic spells so what is the importance what is the relation between sdb and heart failure patients with heart failure and uh, sleep disordered breathing whether it osa or csa are independent risk factors for worse prognosis and death so that is very important then uh, uh, daytime central sleep uh, chain stroke respiration is an significant independent predictor for mortality and that is also important because see sometimes the attenders would come and tell us uh, sometimes this person, my relative is not breathing and uh, sometimes what happens is the sisters themselves will tell that another important thing is that even when the treatment of heart failure is optimized like in our patient persistent low levels of sleep apnea at the rosa or csa have an important negative impact on prognosis so it may be mild but even they have a, a negative prognosis another important thing is heart failure patients with sleep disordered breathing usually do not have typical symptoms because of in, uh, like uh, the increased daytime sleepiness because of uh, increased sympathetic drive so this you can understand here nwh class 4 and 3 they have predominant central sleep apnea and chain stroke respiration whereas class 1 or 2 will have predominant uh, obstructive sleep apnea so how do you treat them there were initial small studies which came in uh, new england journal and patient with osa heart failure cpap they looked at and what happened is there was reduction of obstructive sleep apnea osa there was some improvement in different fraction improvement in heart rate and blood pressure and it one study showed improvement in systolic volumes and there was subsequently another study called safe trial it was not a heart failure trial it was a neutral trial campap trial again was neutral so which of trial which looked at the cumulative incidence of the primary endpoint and cardiovascular death and if you see there was no benefit with adaptive so ventilation there is positive a uh, uh, high end positive ventilation and if you see here deaths actually increased so so hf was a warning that okay we may reduce uh, uh, the or so control the comorbidity but you should look at the hard end points like cardiovascular death or cardiovascular events then came uh, phrenic nerve stimulation it was there for a long time but the studies came recently and this is a percutaneous trans uh, venous unilateral stimulation of phrenic nerve can be done easily by the electrophysiologist and it's interesting it actually once you are awake it gets automatically switched off and uh, and it slowly actually it said that it fondles the uh, diaphragm and smooth uptake is not like our uh, when we do pacemakers the uh, diaphragm gets stimulated patient gets a jerk it is not like that it is slow and uh, slow and steady 
increased stimulation so the body or diaphragm is taut and we will have actually air is pulled into the thorax where versus pushing by positive ventilation and this we can see it's a related 2018 subgroup analysis on heart failure patient on the remedy pivotal trial we can see apnea hypopnea index which is a index for the the, the osa or sleep per se significant improvement but if you see the nhr class improved the quality of life improved patient felt better there was some improvement in injection fraction there was no change in mortality to low events and there was less hospitalization for heart failure so what are the guidelines say the guidelines say that the patient with nhr class 2 to 4 and suspicion of sleep disorder breathing or excess daytime sleepiness a formal sleep assessment is reasonable class 2a never would see next patient with cardiovascular and again they say that should differentiate between uh differentiate between uh, central and sleep apnea is very important because so much of when they tried but a patient with predominant uh, central sleep apnea and it was harmful and patient with cardiovascular disease and obstructive sleep apnea it may be cpap may be reasonable to improve sleep quality and type daytime sleepiness class 2b b low evidence b and note that it is not for cardiovascular endpoints it may really it's improve sleep quality and daytime sleepiness and big red one patient with nhca class 2 to 4 and central sleep apnea adaptive or positive ventilation causes harm now let us move on to obesity this obesity crisis obesity is one of the leading cause of morbidity and mortality in the world obesity is a strong independent predictor for cardiovascular disease and heart failure even in the absence of other risk factors about 10 to 14 or 11 to 14 person with heart failure have obesity as the only etiology or the unique etiology so obesity leads on to heart failure no doubt what about the indian scenario it is little dangerous that's why i put it in red but 75% of indians are overweight but 50% of urban indians are obese and 26% in rural of rural indians are obese as evidenced by the uh, as evidenced by uh, the unmekrishan study on western indian population and there is what is called uh, obesity paradox obesity is an, we know that obesity is an independent risk factor for developing heart failure but once heart failure is diagnosed and established obesity is associated with lower mortality with a wide spectrum of bmi and that is obesity paradox but we have to understand that this protective effect disappeared at more extreme levels of obesity especially bmi more than 35 what are the potential mechanisms potential mechanisms are the non intentional weight loss and low bmi may be a marker for severe heart failure and cardiac ataxia there's protective cytokines and uh, neurocrine profiles in obesity in obesity there's a attenuated response attenuated response to the uh, rasi uh, ras uh, activation and increased muscle mass and muscle tension may be there in obese fit people and obesity is a high energy resource state and heart failure is a high energy requirement state and this meta analysis showed that it's a benefit in overweight people at to obese people and once it cross 35 then the benefit is not there and low uh, bmi there was definite harm and this that was in chronic heart failure in acute heart failure also obesity paradox exists but you have to understand that there is no obesity paradox in heart failure with preserved ejection fraction how do you treat them so patients at risk stage a and b of heart failure the treatment of obesity with diet exercise approved drugs like we have to understand that glp1 has been approved for weight reduction and surgery bariatric surgery may reduce incidence of heart failure but and what are the recommendations is american recommendation in circulation came in circulation obesity should be controlled or avoided to prevent development of heart failure with class 1c and this study this is the uh, 2019 european heart journal they looked at patients who had uh, bariatric surgery and they found that incidence of heart failure was reduced so maybe in morbidly obese patient with what at i have high risk of heart failure giving and uh, doing uh, obesity reduction programs may be beneficial 
So as per European guidelines, weight loss as an intervention has now been prospectively shown either beneficial or safe in, safe in HFREF. And weight loss occurring in heart failure, especially non, uh, non uh, what do you call uh, person uh, with non-intentional is also with high mortality and poor quality of life. So patient with moderate degrees of obesity, weight loss cannot be recommended. And patient with more, as I said before, BMI more than 35 to 45, weight loss can be considered. And deficiency. And deficiency, there are certain caveats that's very important. And deficiency is common in both anemic and non-anemic heart failure patients. About 30%, one third of non-anemic heart failure patients have and deficiency. And high NIH status and NT pro BNP is related or is a predictor for disordered and status. And in acute heart failure and deficiency is there about 50%. And and deficiency beyond anemia is associated with increased mortality. That's also important because somebody is just anemic and non and deficient, their mortality is lesser than somebody who has no anemia and deficient or anemia with and deficiency that has got the highest mortality. And and deficiency, but not anemia, is associated with reduced exercise capacity in patients with heart failure. So there are two problems here a storage problem, utilization problem, and and storage ferritin. And is the marker utilization T sat tantrum saturation is the marker. How do you diagnose ferritin less than 100 microgram per liter or ferritin 100 to 299 microgram per liter and T sat less than 20? So the ESC uh, uh, in 2016 had very definite uh, uh, viewpoints on that. What they said is and deficiency in patients with heart failure is common and an important comorbidity irrespective of anemia. It's associated with decreased exercise performance and impaired uh, uh, health rated quality of life and worse prognosis. And they all go on to say that ANSAT is to be valid in all newly diagnosed heart failure. Look at the level of evidence 1C. And deficiency definition, I already said, uh, for it in less than 100 or uh, for it in 100 to 99 and TSAT less than 20, and they should be simultaneously evaluated together. And if you had and deficiency and, any, and anemia, look for underlying cause of anemia. So what happens in a patient in the Indian scenario, this is the Rajasthan study, 76% of heart failure patients in India were and deficient. In Singapore, it was as high as 82%. Does oral and replacement therapy help? The short answer is in heart failure, no. Because heart failure and is not absorbed well and iron utilized well because of elevated hepcidin. Hepcidin like, is, a, is a marker of increased uh, inflammation and heart failure is a situation of high inflammation. And Indians, like there's a lot of low grade inflammation. And also in Indians, we, we take a lot of tea and tea drinking, Dr. Shafan Anker is very fond of saying tea drinking, especially green tea, may elevate hepcidin, so it may inhibit an absorption. And there was a study called ANOT heart failure study, which showed that oral iron therapy in heart failure with iron deficiency is it's, it's a failure. Then let's come to trials. The trials, there were many small trials and the randomized control trials looked at soft endpoints like sequence walk test distance, the quality of life, the VO2, and Dr. Anker put all this thing together, meta-analysis, and you can see the numbers are low here. And with meta-analysis had hard endpoint, but they remain meta-analysis of, uh, of uh, uh, smaller trials. So guidelines say that with patients with iron deficiency, iron replacement with ferric carboxymaltose, it's a class 2B indication as per HA. It's a class 2A indication, level of evidence A recommendation as per ESC. So how do you approach these patients? These patients, step one, check patient has got five, the patient with heart failure. Check one, check for iron deficiency. It did not say check for anemia. Step one, check for iron deficiency. That is ferritin, you know the values. Then step two, check anemia. If it's got anemia plus iron deficiency, then look for other causes and then 
treat for iron deficiency. If the hemoglobin is more than 15, do not administer IV iron. As of now, we don't have data for acute heart failure. We don't have data for hemoglobin more than 15. We don't have data for HFF. We do not have data for class one patients. And treatment is very simple. Ferric carboxymaltose, they say 500 to 1,500. But simplest, what I follow is give 1,000 milligram IV. And uh, next schedule visit, if it's one month, uh, uh, at one month, repeat for it in TSAT. And if it is low, ready, give the dose again. Again, depending on the hemoglobin and uh, body weight. And uh, when you chronic follow-up, every uh, uh, one to times a year, do it. And uh, what are the, there are new ongoing trials. You can see these trials, the importance is that the numbers are higher. They included HFPEF and acute heart failure. They included uh, the stronger endpoints and the, at least two of them are investigate initiated non-pharma trials. So let the results come. What about depression? Are we ignoring important comorbidities? Uh, uh, editorial from Jack, depression is very common and associated with hospital increased hospital admissions, emergency room visit and mortality. The, it is, the prevalence is about 25% for outpatients and about 70% for inpatients. And in, in general population, it's about five to 10%. And why it's a complex uh, uh, relation, hippocampus is uh, important for neuropsychological symptoms and hippocampus is exclusively sensitive to hypoxia and heart failure. And this study showed that there is relation between depression and all cause mortality and hospitalization. What does the guideline say? Depression is common and associated with worse outcomes. High index of suspicion is needed. Routine screening is, is a good practice. Psychosocial intervention and pharmacological treatment uh, is, uh, as well as exercise is good. Uh, SSRIs are safe. Cognitive behavioral therapy can be considered and depression heart failure is an underdiagnosed entity. Takotsubo, stress-related broken heart syndrome, but usually they improve. Long-term, they improve. And important thing is that multiple comorbidities together increases the uh, survival. This is survival here. If there are multiple comorbidities, three plus comorbidities, survival is reduced. So my patient had uh, iron deficiency. It's hemoglobin was normal, but he had iron deficiency. He had sleep apnea, obstetric sleep apnea, and he had depression. And uh, he had great difficulty. He was on small doses of uh, uh, antidepressants, but he had great difficulty. We convinced him to have a, psych a psychological uh, uh, therapy. And antidepressants was corrected. He had a CPAP, and he improved dramatically. So take home messages are there is comorbidities are important, especially in quality of life, sleep disorders, OSA is common, CPAP reduce symptoms, CSA is there in late stage, avoid pressure uh, ventilation in uh, uh, CSA, central sleep apnea. Obesity coexists, always remember obesity paradox, and deficiency to be evaluated and treated all half rough. Depression is more common than it seems. Thank you very much. Yeah. Dr. Ayengar, please uh, unmute yourself. Thank you, Professor Brian, for that excellent presentation. You talked about Takutsubo. Uh, have you seen more of it during COVID crisis? Uh, thankfully, no, in the sense like uh, there are people who came with uh, ischemic symptoms and breathlessness and with normal coronaries. But pure LV dysfunction, which improves over time and COVID positive, thankfully, we have not seen. Like ours is not a COVID specific hospital, but now good number of COVID patients and good number of ICU patients with COVID are there. But uh, pure Takotsubo, and interestingly, what they described is reverse Takotsubo. That is not the apical ballooning. The reverse of apical ballooning has been described in COVID patients. Uh, Jayesh, can you yeah. ask the questions for speakers and Dr. Joseph too? Yeah, it was an excellent talk. Something new we have uh, uh, regarding the obesity and all, and some of the common things, but we are finding uncommon. We are not uh, treating that cause, so uh, we have found out that. But 
I think uh, what uh, what is your view on uh, iron therapy? Whether we should give routinely, or whether we should wait some stu- some studies? Or iron uh, oral iron is totally ineffective? What what is seen in your practice? Okay, uh, it's very simple. Oral iron therapy in heart failure anemia or iron deficiency is of no use. I had the uh, anode study has shown that. Second, the ESC is very clear. All patients with heart failure. and class 2 to 4 so class 2 to 3 and efficacy in class 4 has not been proven class 2 and 3 totally asymptomatic patients still no data so they improve quality of life 6 minute walk test and uh, the vo2 max and when the so as of now esc recommends very clearly check iron deficiency in all patients with heart hfrf class 2 to 3 and treat them and treat them and there will be significant improvement in symptoms and uh, sequent walk test duration and uh, whether it will translate into morbidity mortality and heart failure uh, hospitalization the meta analysis say yes but we'll have to wait for farh f2 and and it will come shortly maybe next year this time we'll have a definitive thing and there big trials 1200 2000 patient and non pharma sponsor trials is there any recommendation for uh, phrenic nerve stimulation okay as of now phrenic nerve stimulation is approved for central sleep apnea okay is not for heart failure central sleep apnea so if your patient has got uh, that what i showed was the sub analysis or post hoc analysis of the remedy study and they showed some benefit but what you understand is central sleep apnea begets heart failure and heart failure begets central sleep apnea and central sleep apnea uh, like patients have is a mortality indicator so i would not as of now i would not recommend unless there is a strong study for everybody with for uh, so central uh, sleep central sleep apnea and heart failure if they have significant symptoms then definitely yes i would think about it i don't know that it's available in india i don't think so but in the west uh, in us like people are very uh, bullish about it because for ep people it is a cake walk so it is a relatively simple procedure and patients are happy so hard end points are not at so post hoc analysis cannot be extrapolated into guidelines but if somebody has got significant symptoms and uh, uh, severe central sleep apnea and heart failure nothing it's safe safety has been shown that is my is question for professor paul can you take up that professor mm-hmm. I'm suggesting Paul. Otherwise, there are some more questions for uh, Dr. Sanjay and Dr. Rambuj Rai. Can we take up, uh, Dr. Professor Rambuj Rai? How long yeah. do we have to continue medications after complete recovery? Yeah, so that's a very relevant question. Uh, I don't think we have definite answers, but I think what we can learn is from the TRED uh, heart failure tri- uh, study, which was presented, uh, which was presented. Uh, last year in lancet and uh, they showed that uh, there is a very a large chance of relapse if you stop neurohormonal blocked uh, blocking drugs like beta blockers and uh, uh, ras inhibitors so i would say once your patient has been uh, stable for about 6 months uh, gradually wean them off don't stop at one go wean them off closely monitor and if you see there is a recurrence in the left ventricular dysfunction i think then you need to go back on those drugs but uh, gradually weaning them off over one year is the pragmatic approach and uh, that is what i i would suggest for withdrawal of the medicines uh, the other drug uh, the mention was uh, use of drugs during pregnancy i think uh, for uh, prevention so again uh, uh, if the patient has lv dysfunction you continue on beta blockers and uh, uh, the isocyanide uh, dinitrate and uh, advalazine combination yeah, if the lv function has recovered then again uh, you know we, we, you need to start Hello? these drugs only once they become symptomatic whether prophylactically using beta blocker in them is uh, useful or not there is again not data 
but people with persistent renal dysfunction, you continue them on uh, these medicines uh, uh, so that to prevent worsening of heart failure. Any preference between epilene non or spironolactone? I, I think most of the data is with spironolactone. The larger studies when they started uh, doing uh, MRA blockade and the, both the biggest studies are with uh, spironolactone. It's just that the tolerance is uh, may not be there and the problems of gynecomastia is uh, common. Uh, those are the patients I would uh, normally uh, prescribe and do not because of obviously for in our settings, uh, there's a lot of a cost difference between the two. So I would prefer a spinal lactone as the first line of age. Uh, now, Professor Justin Paul is back. No. Uh, this is uh, muted. So, sir, if I can make one comment about... Uh, there's a question uh, for you. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, the continuation of TREDHF. There's uh, something practically, if you do a... Uh, longitudinal strain and the EF is still normal, near normal, but the GLS is low, then that is an indicator for continuing. Tradechoff was only on DCM, only 55 patients, so 44% had recurrence on stopping. And there was another small uh, opinion that uh, if you want to stop, uh, reduce beta blockers, but continue uh, RAS inhibitors or AC. So, but uh, even if it improves, look at the longitudinal strain. Nowadays, everybody can do a longitudinal strain. And if the, even if it's preserved ejection fraction or improved ejection fraction, the strain, uh, GLS is low, then we should continue treatment. Uh, yeah, yeah, Dr. Abram, uh, yeah. How, what is any specific treatment for Takosubo uh, cardiomyopathy? It depends. There is no specific treatment per se. I am not aware of it because many of them are self-limiting. Treat as acute heart failure and most of them are self-limiting and most of them improve. And there was one study which was published in BMJ Open Access. They looked at the long-term follow-up of that and found that majority, almost the, 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 the recovery was quite good and long-term prognosis was good. It was uh, worse than people who do not have problems, but then it is much better than people who had CAD. So it's as of now, we can call it that it's a recovered disease. It is not exactly equivalent to somebody who had uh, HEFRA for uh, chemotherapy induced uh, right. uh, uh, therapy. So I would not uh, consider long term therapy with. I would like to get the opinion from the uh -huh. uh, the other uh -huh. panelists because this is one question which I wanted to discuss because it's, there is very hardly any data on that. Sanjay, I would have to say. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Subo. Dr. Subo, uh, it's mostly reversible. Whatever experience I have had in my clinical practice, uh, and I think uh, the best thing it works there is beta blockers. Uh, uh, and uh, I have had at least experience with 10 Dhaka Subo cardiomyopathies and um, all of them have recovered. Uh, but we have to actually painstakingly wait for at least uh, 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 two to three months. Um, all of them recovered. Theoretically, beta blocker should work because it is yeah. beta at the rejects, no? Absolutely. Yes. Sir, I think it is over uh, 9.30 now. It's time to yeah. wind up the session. Yeah. Dr. Joseph, would you like to wind up? No, no, sir, you were the anchor, okay. no? You can, uh, I would like to thank uh, Dr. 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 Yes. speakers and my co-chairpersons for this excellent meeting that we all had and we enjoyed and learned a lot. Uh, thanks once again. And also thank all the people who logged in and asked questions, which were answered very adequately. Thank you very much. Good night and uh, stay safe. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hari Kishan, sir, and HFA for inviting us for a nice thank scene. You, thank, you. <laughs> thank, thank you and you. good night. Yeah, good night. Thank you so much, sir.